23rd. If we could please introduce ourselves. I'm Gabrielle Whaler, communications intern. Yeah. Leslie Harvey, clerk to the board. Good afternoon, I'm County Commissioner Denise Driehaus. Jeff Aluto, County Administrator. Michael Fruit. Thank you all so much. I'm Stephanie Summerall Dumas, President of the Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners. So let's get busy, ladies. We have quite a bit on the agenda. Our first item on the agenda is COVID-19 and monkeypox comprehensive report. Commissioner, our health commissioner, Greg Kesterman. Well, good afternoon, and I good appreciate you, you having me again today. Um, today, I don't have a ton of updates, but I will uh, answer a question that I get asked many times about um, the status of uh, Hamilton County as far as community transmission. So in just a moment, we'll, we'll touch on that. As far as our cases per day, so this is the raw count, seven-day average. We are at 199 for Hamilton County. That number was from Thursday of last week. Um, and we continue to see those cases per day drop, which is good news. <clears throat> You can see much relief on the map before you um, over the course of just August. You can see Hamilton County now has kind of transitioned from that upper threshold down to the high threshold. And we continue to see um, signs that many of these jurisdictions and zip codes will begin to decrease even further. As far as what we are seeing predominantly in Hamilton County, we continue to see the BA5 variant, which is a variant of Omicron COVID-19. Um, we are seeing some increases week after week of that BA4.6 variant increasing throughout the United States and, and specifically our, our region. So um, the other metrics that we kind of keep track of closely are hospitalizations. Last time, two weeks ago when I was here, uh, the graph on the left which shows hospitalizations was fairly flat. This time it's been a, uh, updated to show a decrease in overall patients within the hospital systems. The graph on the right uh, which shows um, ICU admissions continues to be all over the place, but generally we're not seeing any major increases in, in, uh, in patients entering the hospital's ICU. Looking at it once again, just over time, right now we have 198 individuals within our hospital systems, 36 within the ICU, and 15 on ventilators. And no change over the last couple of weeks with regards to deaths in Hamilton County associated with COVID-19. So switching now to the um, speak up, they can't yeah. hear you. Back. So switching now to the uh, the cases per hundred thousand. This is actually the big update. Um, we are at two fifteen. This number is updated on the CDC website more often than once a week, but it's only reflected in the, the COVID threshold once a week. So today, if you looked at the COVID threshold, we're at 215 cases per 100,000. But when you dive into the data and you actually look at a more recent update, which is from Sunday, we are at 185 cases per 100,000. 200 is that magic number. So I can't predict what will happen on Thursday, but all of the trends look to be heading in the right direction so that on Thursday, we likely, and I, I don't have a crystal ball, but likely we will be either yellow or green, which is low for community transmission. So we're watching that data very closely. Our office will put out a uh, notice to the media to make sure that they're aware, as well as uh, the commissioner, so that your offices are aware. So once again, here's that map. Here's what Southwest Ohio and uh, Northern Kentucky and um, parts of Indiana look like currently. Uh, Hamilton County at this moment is high community transmission. You may recall when we transition, hopefully on Thursday, to medium transmission, uh, the big change is that the CDC no longer would recommend masks for our community. And we would continue to ask people to have extra caution when they're around individuals who have um, illnesses that might make them at greater risk for severe COVID-19. The other change that happened since I, oops, I'll share this too. You can start to see some of that relief in Ohio on August 18th on Thursday of last week. Some green showing up, definitely more yellow. And hopefully on Thursday of this week, we'll, we'll be in an even more different position. The other change that happened since I last uh, had opportunity to brief the commissioners um, was a change in some of the messaging and a change in who is uh, quarantining with COVID-19. So first, just for clarity, um, the CDC put out this graphic. This is for individuals who are um, come down positive with COVID-19. The day you get your symptoms or the day if you're symptom asymptomatic that you test is day zero. And they are still recommending five days of isolation, five days of keeping away from other people, if possible, including family members, um, so that you're not further spreading it. 
But the best news for us as a community is with regards to those that have come in contact with a person with COVID-19. So a close contact, typically we would have asked you up until now to quarantine. We are no longer asking people to quarantine, but rather wear a mask. On day five, we are recommending that you test for COVID-19, and on day 10, you no longer have to wear that mask. Um, so this is a big change. You know, for two and a half years, we've been recommending quarantine of people exposed. We now understand some of the risks. We now have treatments. We now have vaccines, and that is allowing for the CDC to make these additional changes. Uh, you've seen this slide before. We continue to make progress on our vaccination efforts. Uh, locations can be found on our website, hcph.org or you can visit testandprotectcincy.com for all of the locations in our community. And then the last slide um, I have is related to monkeypox. Not a lot of change since I last met with the commissioners. In fact, the numbers for Hamilton County have not really changed all that much either, which is great news. Uh, for the United States, we're at 15,400 cases of monkeypox, and you can see New York's about 3,000, California's about 2,500, Florida is about 1,500, Ohio is about 133. <clears throat> and Hamilton County, there are six cases in the city of Cincinnati and two cases outside of the city of Cincinnati. Our team continues to align with the other health departments in our county. We are providing vaccines that are available to those at highest risk, and we will continue to make sure that messaging is up to date and alignment is in place within our jurisdiction. That is it for my slides, but happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, we certainly will be watching the transmission level um, to see if we need to uh, mandate the mask in here. So we'll be looking forward to it going down. Um, and before I, I have no questions or comments, of course, a very thorough report. I will pass it on to Vice President Reese. But I would like to say I, I was sitting here thinking about, all right, ladies, let's get busy. And I said, wait a minute, we have gentlemen up here that need to get busy. We have gentlemen out there that need to be, get busy. I so, we could, could relax. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I just apologize for that because we're all working so hard. But it just kind of sounds good, like a movie or something. But thank you. I just wanted to apologize for that. So Vice President Reese. Thank you, um, Health Commissioner Kesterman. I uh, had a question about uh, people have been hearing a lot in the media as it relates to the CDC and the head of the CDC talking about the, some of their findings that uh, mixed messaging, uh, messaging confusion, and I know we get a lot of our uh, stuff and our messaging from the CDC. Um, can you maybe talk about are there any changes? Are there some things that, uh, that I don't know if they've started on some new things that make things a little more easier? But, you know, the survey was saying that a lot of people were, um, you know, confused because they'll say this, they'll say that, then they change, and they admitted through their findings that uh, they weren't moving as quick, they weren't as uh, precise with the messaging. Uh, so I know that you're in contact with the CDC. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Well, to start, I do just want to continue to reiterate, if there is a scientific body on public health in the nation, it is the Centers for Disease Control. They have budgets for doing research, and they certainly have um, a significant wealth of expertise within, within their uh, agency. The comments related to um, some of the speed of messaging and some of the speed of needed change certainly resonate. There are many times here in Hamilton County and the state of Ohio where messaging would come out the day of. I'd find out about changes at a national level on the day of from the media rather than getting internal communications. And things like that create difficulties when I'm trying to create messaging for our population. In addition, there's certainly times, including with the quarantine updates that I just shared, where it seems like the scientific evidence is showing that we are having some lesser significance of disease, although I don't want to diminish it. I shared two weeks ago that we're still seeing one Hamilton County resident die every four days. So it's still more impactful than the flu and needs significance. But some of the shifting that happens as a result of, of that science knowledge probably could happen quicker. And it will continue to help create more trust in an agency if we're, if we're moving and allowing people more opportunities to take masks off or to uh, engage more in a school environment, things like that at a quicker pace. I certainly think it would help us as well as at a national level with reputation thank you for that and then also just wanted to just highlight again uh, with your leadership and the collaboration uh, with our uh, board 
Um, I just think, certainly, I just always think the right thing that we did was to continue funding for testing and uh, making it accessible, uh, the vaccine accessible as well, and just want to continue to help get that message out because people don't think it's important until something happens and they call like, where can I get that tested or where, 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 where can I go? And uh, it has helped people because it's no charge and your staff has been great. Uh, a lot of people started shutting down. I know in Kentucky, different places, they were shutting down but people still needed to know where to go. And so I just wanted to commend your team again. And I think the collaboration and the uh, recommendation that uh, was put forward and we were able to make sure it goes forward was important. So people have some place to go at no cost to get testing and as well as to get uh, the vaccinations. Thank you for that comment. And certainly I appreciate all three commissioners um, efforts. It's really been amazing, the collaboration. And I think if somebody wants a test here in Hamilton County or a vaccine, we as a community are better than anywhere else in the state because of the partnerships. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kesterman, for your report and your update. Um, can you tell us how many vaccines have been administered for monkeypox in the county? So um, our jurisdiction uh, last week ran a clinic. We only had 30 doses and we administered all 30 doses. We have another clinic scheduled tomorrow um, with uh, at least 60, possibly as many as 100 people getting vaccinated. And then we are anticipating additional doses of vaccine. The big change that has happened that is allowing the vaccine to go further. Um, two weeks ago, uh, the FDA made a modification to the emergency use of the vaccine and prior one vial equaled one dose and now one vial equals five doses and it's administered a little bit differently and uh, the uh, the emergency use authorization shows the effectiveness of both methods and so we have quickly worked with the city of cincinnati and transitioned how both teams are administering vaccine and should be able to stretch our vaccine even further um, i do not have updated numbers for the city of cincinnati so those numbers i shared are just for my jurisdiction okay and, and so have you found that the demand is pretty constant for the vaccine? It's a great question. So um, a couple weeks ago, as you know, we opened a survey up for uh, receiving people on a wait list. And we are prioritizing those in the medium high to high risk. Um, but in total on our survey, as of this morning, we have 1,100 people registered, which in comparison to COVID, I can tell you after a couple weeks, we had tens of thousands of people registered. And so we are effectively able to reach those that are currently classifying at the highest risks. And we'll continue as, as we've diminished that list to, to none, we will continue to open it up and provide greater access to our community. Okay, great. And, and just lastly, um, can you remind folks how to get signed up for that? Yes, so if you're interested in receiving the monkeypox vaccine, I would recommend that you visit hcph.org. And uh, right on our homepage, there's a link for monkeypox information, and the survey is on that page. And I would re recommend that you register both on our webpage and also the City of Cincinnati Health's webpage. We are working together. We're sharing, sharing information so that we're most efficient and reaching those at greatest risk as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And thank you for your work on that, especially the collaboration with the city. Um, and, you know, we've built the infrastructure to collaborate, and this is a good example of how that is now going to work into the future. That's so. correct, yes. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a great one. Mm -hmm. So we'll go to item two on our agenda, which is 2023 budget requests. Um, for the public, just to know that the board is just, and administration has just started the process for looking at the 2023 budget. Um, of course, the community will be involved with public hearings to be able to give your input. But at this point uh, today, we're having departments come in with their requests. So we have John Brugan, who was here, our assistant county administrator. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And you virtually said what I was going to say, which oh. is we just started this process. Um, so we have presentations today and going every, every meeting after this through the 27th of December. Uh, December, September. <laughs> um, that would be fun, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, we expect to have an administrator's recommended budget to you around the mid mid to late October, and then we'll move through budget hearings after that, and with a with an approved budget in December, hopefully. Um, one small, a couple of small notes. Um, I just wanted to FYI, some of the numbers still, because we are very much at the front of this process, the numbers shift a little bit in those requests um, between what you saw in the packets that the budget office generated last week 
and the numbers that some of the departments will be showing to you today. They shouldn't change much. It's just you know, as we're as we're you know, squaring down on on what the correct request numbers are. Um, but you will see sometimes some small diff variations between those two thing things. And then I do have a list of you for you. Uh, what the hearings are going to look like over the next. Okay. So this is Thank Susie, you. Who's coming in next. Thank you so much. And unless you guys have questions, um, we can go right to um, Engineer Beck. Great, John. And I think what you said about the numbers being fluid at this time, um, and I'm speaking to the residents or whoever's watching, the fact that their input will also make it even more fluid as Absolutely. we look at priorities. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So we have Eric Beck, our engineer, is here. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you uh, for having me here to present today. Um, as, as you may recall, last year I did not have a PowerPoint. I think I was the only one this year I tried to catch up to speed. So, so uh, we'll get through this pretty quickly. Um, uh, the Hamilton County Engineer's Office is by the Ohio Revised Code has statutory responsibility for county roads and bridges. This includes maintenance, inspection, and management of numerous assets that fall in the right-of-way. Although we perform a large number of duties, our most visible task is one that generates the most calls is our winter operations, snow and ice removal. We strive to keep the county roads passable during a storm and back to dry pavement shortly after the storm ends. There's a list up there of uh, other things that we do. Um, some of the items that we're responsible for are listed on this slide. We have over 1,200 miles of pavement, 423 bridges, along with the associated infrastructure. Additionally, we pre perform technical reviews of property conveyances, land transactions, and maintain the parcel fabric for the county GIS system. That's all I'm going to cover today. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Dorger, who is our uh, budget and financial director for the engineer's office. And she's going to go through the uh, the numbers, and I will be here to answer any questions. Thanks, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we have at the engineer's office. We actually have five different sub funds that we will look at. Um, all of these are under Fund Two, the Special Operating Fund. All of these funds are derived what we can ex use our expenses for by various sections of the Ohio Revised Code. Um, so some of the funds that we'll look at today are our road and bridge fund. We have two different permissive auto tax funds, one for the county uh, roads and bridges, and then one for municipalities. We also have a stormwater fund and a major highway operations fund. The first fund in our biggest um, expense and revenue is our road and bridge fund. So our request for 2023 is 23780973 Um the pie graph on the left shows that our personnel is salary and benefits. Um, we currently have budgeted 157 employees, same as last year. So really our expenses in our road and bridge fund are kind of business as usual for us. Um, other expenditures that we have are about 6.7, 6.8 million. Um, a lot of that is due to our, you know, highway operations with fuel, um, salt, calcium chloride, we repair vehicles for um, all, a lot of different county departments as well as our own. So there is that expense. We also have um, capital bud budgeted in this. Um, we are looking to replace typically about three dump trucks every year. We're on a 20 year replacement cycle with those. So that's a big portion of that. Um, and then any other foreman's vehicles, project inspection vehicles, things like that. Um, and then for our out, Operating transfers out, we're budgeting about 2.4 million. This is basically our contribution to get money into projects like resurfacing, um, the thermoplastic projects, the things that we bring to you guys at the board, um, you know, every couple of weeks. Um, let's see. So, and then on the upper right hand corner, um, we do budget fairly high here because we have a lot of unexpected expenses when it comes to snow and ice. We don't know how many snowstorms we're going to get. We don't know how many landslides are going to happen throughout the year. So even though you can kind of see like 2020, 2021, we kind of budget around that $24 million um, threshold. 
but we really are only expending about 19, maybe 19 and a half million. Um, some of that again is because of the landslides and stuff that we're just kind of proactively being prepared in the case that we need it. Um, and some of that is also because we've had some staffing things like we're budgeting for 157 employees, but we currently only have 116 filled at the moment. So highway maintenance workers, foremen, things like that, we're filling those positions as they become open or trying to. So our revenue for the road and bridge fund, um, majority of this is our motor vehicle license tax and our gasoline tax. Uh, we get 13.7 million in motor vehicle license tax every year, um, roughly, and about 3.6 million in gas tax. Um, we do have other revenue sources, one of those being the tax map subsidy that the general fund provides. That's $505,000 on an annual basis. Um, by the Ohio Revised Code, the auditor's office is to perform those duties, but the engineer's office has, I don't know, maybe about five or six years ago, has taken over those duties. So then we're reimbursed for those duties um, with the general fund money on that. Um, <clears throat> the revenue appropriations are pretty on target. It was a little bit off in 2020 and 2021. 2020, we obviously had a slip back in gas tax and a slip back in our motor vehicle license tax. And then in 21, you'll see we were up 15% because we kind of made up for those. Um, so really, I mean, in 2022 and 2023, we're looking at that 8.6 million, or 18, I'm sorry, not 8.6, that would be bad, 18.6 um, or $19 million a year in revenue. Okay, our next fund that we're gonna talk about is our um, permissive auto tax fund. This is. So there's two different permissive auto tax funds. This one is for county roads and bridges. Um, so our budgeted expense for 2023 is $10,076,000. Um, almost all of this is used on, well actually all of it is used on our road and bridge projects. So we transfer out 9 million um, into those projects. We try to leverage those dollars, our 9 million with like OPWC grants and ODOT grants, sort of grants, things like that. So even though we're only putting in 9 million a year, we're really leveraging those dollars and getting quite, quite a bit more road project out of that. Um, we do pay for our OPWC loans here. There are zero interest loans that we have. There are six of them that we currently have open. And then um, some general engineering and general um, geotechnical services, as well as our township 20% fund is where we spend this money out of here. Um, the revenue that we are looking to get in 2023 is a little over 9 million. Um, our fund balance has been growing here. We have been closing some old projects out, like returning those cash balances to this particular fund. So it is our intention to actually budget a little bit more and put more into the roads and kind of get that fund balance down um, to where it was. Let's see. The next fund is our permissive auto municipal fund. Um, this is our basically our, 20, or our municipal road fund program that we come to the board with every year. Um, we budget $2.1 million in that particular project. One million of that is for our county bridge um, agreement that we have. And then the other million and a thousand is basically uh, 100,000 is other road projects that people apply for, municipalities apply for, and they're rated and issued as the, at that recommendation. Um, the revenue that we are looking to get in this fund is two, a little over 2.3 million. Um, again, all derived from the Ohio Revised Code from uh, motor vehicle license tax. Um, this fund is pretty steady. I mean, we kind of budget what we get in and it doesn't really change too much year after year. The next fund is our stormwater fund. Um, this is, there's a couple of different expenses in here, but a lot of those actually go back to county departments and the services they provide for the stormwater fund in the stormwater district. Um, so we do have some personnel expenses. We do have um, expenses that we pay to our public works department, our health, um, health district and our soil and water department. We also have a consultant that runs this district for us for the most part. Um, so there are some expenses there as well. Um, and then our revenue for this 
is from our service fees. So through people's property tax bills, they have a stormwater fee on there, and that's the revenue that's generated. So the expenses here are $2,465,497. Um, $2, um, we typically don't spend that. We do budget for a, uh, like a CIP program, a capital improvement program, at about $500,000 every year. And it's kind of a buffer if, if municipalities come up and say, hey, we want to use this or we would like to do that, then that's what we use that for. Um, we haven't done that in the last couple of years, but so that's why our expenses are a little bit more than our revenue, but it usually is pretty flat every year. Um, and then the final fund, I don't have a slide on this one because we really didn't budget any expenses or anything in here, um, but our highway, our major highway operation fund, these are restricted for um, construction projects on Ronald Reagan Cross County Highway or arterial bridges and roadways, roadways to this highway. We don't have anything in the works for that for 2023. Um, I did budget $800 in interest, <laughs> um, but no expenses. So. so thank you for your time today. That's all that we have, but I'm happy to take any questions as Eric would, I'm sure as well. Thank you so much for your comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, you guys, um, it looks as if you've been good stewards with the money that you've been given. Uh, so that's always good to see. Um, you're staying under, but also have enough to supplement any sort of um, emergencies and you can buffer it yourselves without having to come back uh, to us. And I always hear Eric say, and this is from Permissive Auto Fund, you know, so we're using that money that's out there. Just interested in supplies in general as it relates to gas and salt, rock salt, how much that has gone up. And, and of course, I'm sure that's been included in the budget. But what percentage would you say um, with the salt and the... So fuel from two and a half years ago is up 309%. Mm -hmm. um, our salt from last year to this year is up 19%. The year before that, it was up 15%. So we're climbing there as well. And then as far as our other like asphalt, concrete, things like that, each of those is, I'm just going to put out a rough 10%, but some of them are more, some of them are a little bit less. So, but yes, th th those are all factored into our expense budget yeah, for this year. Yeah, that's a small increase. Um, it seems to be because materials have gone up so much, um, um, building materials and things <laughs> like that. But, some uh, of those we went out to bid for, so uh -huh. we're still kind of in that same year to two year bid. Now, if we go out to bid again in 2023, those probably will end up going up. Yeah. yeah, and we do have that buffered in here. Sure. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, Vice President Reese. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I did have a question. Township 20% fund, what is that? So that is something that we actually, I think we just brought that to the board two weeks ago. Um, so what that is, is it's another part of the Ohio Rise Code that we have committed a certain part of the motor vehicle license tax to allow townships to apply for projects. And they basically, they get a certain percentage based on the population and their, and their vehicle taxes for the year. And then we say, okay, this is your, your balance. Do you want to do a project this year? Yes or no. And they can use that. Some, some townships do it every year. Some townships wait till they get a bigger balance over, you know, a two to three year period. And then they do that. But I'm trying to think what we approved this past time. I think it was around $250,000, maybe 300,000. That was approved this year for the 2022 um, 20% fund for townships. Gotcha. And then you mentioned about the Ronald Reagan Highway. I know we did a lot of, well, it seems like a lot of projects this year. Um, and you're, you're not looking at anything coming up because we did a lot of them this year. That's an Eric question. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, the, the Ronald Reagan fund, that, those were, when that was originally built, the county sold bonds to, to finance that. That's what this money is. It's remaining money from the bond sale that can only be used along Cross County Highway. So the majority of Cross County Highway now is under the jurisdiction of the Ohio Department of Transportation. So we don't have a whole lot there right now. Um, all that the county's responsible for is from Colerain Avenue west to I-275. So that's the only portion that still remains a uh, county maintained road. Wow, okay. And that's the only place we could use that money for. Gotcha, okay. Um, 
And then I guess my last question, um, I know we had passed a resolution to join a... Um, they, they can't hear you back there. Oh, they can't hear me? <laughs> wow, microphone must be off. Um, I know that we had passed to join a resolution recently uh, looking at how we can be more environmental friendly with different things and by you operating fleets. Uh, is that something that you're looking into? Yes, or? our fleet manager is looking into that as we uh, move forward with buying new vehicles. Uh, we're looking at, you know, charging stations, uh, the best use of how we can operate, um, how those vehicles can work within um, our emergency response operations. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. That's all Thank I had. You. Commissioner Driehouse. Thank you. I have a question for both of you. Um, let's, we'll do the finance one first, if you don't mind. So um, I looked at the roads and bridges. Um, this is the sheet that we were emailed from yes. the budget director. And um, I just want to clarify something. So on the revenue and expenses chart, uh, I heard you say that you budget for $24 million, but you generally spend 19 So yes. that, I did notice this discrepancy with the request and um, between the revenue and expenditures. Is that what we're looking at here when you, okay, so yes. that's the gap. Yeah, so um, we have requested in performance and for our 2023 budget, the $23.78 million. Um, but I anticipate, I'm hoping, as long as the weather is nice and <laughs> mm -hmm. we don't have as many landslides that we'll probably spend more along that, 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 that 19 to 20 million. Okay. In 2023. Okay. But it yes, just, that is what you're saying. It's notable that there's a five million dollar gap yes. there. Yeah. So okay. So hopefully we won't spend that 24. Is what you're that, saying? Yeah. And if you look historically across, um, you know, 2022, 21, yep. 20, mm -hmm. you can see that that's kind of yeah. we've budgeted here, but we've spent here. Okay. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so one other question for the engineer. Um, so we in this community passed the Sorta levy. And a lot of that money was infrastructure money. How does that impact the work that you're doing in your budget? Um, how does it impact ours? We will have a lower local portion in projects. Anything we apply for uh, through SORTA, we will have to still provide a match for. So we are looking at when we apply for our projects, I can't recall what we applied for this year through SORTA. I think there was two projects that we applied for. Um, if those are granted, they're currently under review. Sorta of would pick up 80% of the cost, and then our budget would pick up the additional 20%. So it, it helps us leverage our money, as Lisa mentioned before, is to, to leverage it so that we can get more projects done and more work done with our local money. As, as we try to do with every project, we try to leverage it. So it might be helpful for us to be able to see, I don't, if, if it's in here, I apologize that I missed it, but um, the quantity of projects that you are doing related to the budget that you have in addition to the levy dollars it would be interesting to see as that hopefully picks up right and gradually increases that uh, just for us to visually understand how many more projects we're able to do relative to the funding from sorta sure so if you we, could, we can put that to, you want it just sorta or do you want it all of our grant different oh, well, grants. If you want to do all that, would be great. And I know yeah. the sort of money is fairly new. Yeah, um, we, so yeah, we probably haven't seen a whole right. lot of that yet. But I think as we go, it might be interesting for us to understand the value proposition and having that levy on the books and that money available to you guys yeah. for some of the, the projects. We track all of that and we'll be glad to give you a report on it. Okay. That. And let, I just want to follow up quickly on the EV thing. We, we talked about um, electric vehicles and eventually mm -hmm. starting to get those into the fleet. And you had responded about some of the infrastructure that's necessary for us to accomplish that. My recollection is uh, charging stations and um, having somebody in maintenance that is capable of maintaining electric vehicles. Are those the, the two things by way of infrastructure, or are there other things? As far that as infrastructure think? goes, those are the two th main object, objects that we're looking at. Um, you know, there's some operational issues as well because electric vehicles don't work as well in cold weather. So I definitely don't want my snow trucks to be, you know, out there for two hours and then all of a sudden just stop running. So the, there, there are operational issues as well that we're looking into, but there are definitely applications, you know, pool cars, just general use vehicles where, where it would be a great use. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, briefly, um, um, 
Eric, just in terms of, I don't know if you want to speak to this or not, but one of the items I think it's on a, in your uh, fund 025, that's the permissive auto tax uh, county uh, fund, the, the, the chart will show the balance <clears throat> building up there mm -hmm. over time. And I don't know if you just wanted to speak briefly, as someone from the public might see that, that there are some plans for those dollars. Sure, uh, absolutely, so Jeff. That's a great point. We, we try to keep the buffer, like we said. And as that builds up, we're, we're trying to spend that down. We do have a couple large projects coming up in the next couple of years that we anticipate use, budgeting that towards the Western Hills Viaduct being one and the Fields Ertle Corridor uh, improvements being another that will be built in 2020, probably start some major funding in 2025. So we wanna be able to keep the balance and we've got it planned that those will be those funds will be spent down in those upcoming years. Okay, thank you so much. And as we talk about the levy dollars and the grant money, those are additional dollars, not what the county, uh, our board is looking at as it relates to allocation, but it will, uh, it will allow you to leverage other monies uh, as we look at what we want to uh, budget you guys. So, and it's always good not to hear increases, even though we want departments to have what they need to be efficient. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to hear that you're not coming forward with a with an increase, unless you, I mean, you wouldn't come if you didn't need it. So, right. uh, I thank you for your thank you good stewardship. Okay, thanks. Uh, next, we have planning and development, James Noyes. Good afternoon, commissioners. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm, yes. All right, good. I just want to make sure I'm heard today. Again, it's James Noyes, the uh, Director of Planning and Development. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, commend Eric for his great presentation, and uh, obviously he had a, a great PowerPoint. I've simplified it a little from last year. I know you love to hear me talk a lot, so uh, I'm not going to actually do that. So I'm going to let the slides do the talking. You also have a, a in front of you, but the public doesn't, so I'll try to make the best presentation. Let me know if uh, you need an additional description. So we have uh, uh, three funds before us today in planning and development. Uh, as you may know, we have five funds. Uh, we have uh, uh, community development also has CDBG uh, uh, funding as well from HUD. Uh, also ESG and HOME are included in there. And all, but that's in the action plan, which will happen next year. So that's not in here. Also, we have a RPC, which is a separate fund as well. So we have five different funding mechanisms. You only have three in front of you today. So just to clarify, we have three. One is the general fund portion, which covers our development services, which is pl zoning, planning, subdivisions. Also, we have <coughs> the uh, building uh, side of that in general fund. And uh, from there, we have some uh, ancillary services that are IT and backup from there that are included in that. So uh, also, uh, um, we have, uh, um, let me see, the uh, Stormwater Fund, uh, which is essentially a, uh, um, a fund for, which is, uh, uh, works, um, it, it's a uh, fee that uh, is generated, uh, the, the revenue for that uh, from par all the parcels in the townships um, in the unincorporated areas. Uh, from there, there's also some fees that uh, we generate as well. That maintains 300 uh, miles of stormwater, pu public stormwater pipe outside of the right-of-way that's uh, responsible for that. That fund is roughly about, uh, as a cash balance, that uh, has about $3 million uh, over that. And uh, again, it's, it's well-funded. And uh, again, if there are any, within stormwater, we also uh, may come across uh, a pipe that needs fixing, a large project and so forth. You've had a couple in front of you. You may remember King Avenue last year where there was a failure, we had to replace it. So we have money on hand where we need to be able to go in and fix these public stormwater projects. But mostly it's, you know, again, it's just maintaining uh, a typical uh, stormwater pipe. We also get uh, in stormwater fees uh, from stormwater plan review, and again, those are in townships. We also contract with 18 municipalities there. I'll move over to Water Rotary Fund before we start in with the numbers here. Water Rotary Fund, uh, the revenue comes in from um, the uh, fees that we uh, obtain from uh, unincorporated areas uh, of, of the county um, for the water lines, so water usage. So water bills, uh, we uh, use a UAI and, and uh, we generate a, some monies and some funds from that. We also uh, do some repairs that uh, we contract with 19 jur different jurisdictions and we're looking at adding a 20th jurisdiction they've come to us. We have 16,000 
fire hydrants that we are responsible to maintain. That budget is about, uh, the, excuse me, the starting cash balance is on that's about 400,000. So that's, that's kind of the, the smaller fund, but there aren't any big emergencies or anything that we have to be prepared for, uh, like as in stormwater. So that's the, 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 the stormwater fund and the water rotary fund. I think you're familiar with you know, what the general fund is, but the general fund portion is our largest portion here, which you see in front of you. So I'm gonna try to, from that standpoint, to go over these numbers for you um, in, in front of you. Our revenue standpoint from the uh, general fund, this is a collection of building permit fees and zoning permit fees and subdivisions uh, fees and inspection fees as well. We do a projection based upon where our current year is. This year is a record year for us. We have uh, a very high, we're up 5% from last year on our permits, but we're also up, uh, we've already met the permit fees from the entire last year, what we've generated. We've had some huge projects this year. Our valuation is through the roof. Uh, we're 90% up from where we were last year at this time. We have already surpassed last year's valuation. So there's so, so many big projects. So our, our, uh, our uh, revenue looks like it's you know, quite big because we're basing on the projections. Where it'll end up being is likely less than this year. I don't anticipate that we'll have another year like this, but it'll be more than what we budgeted in 2022. So where it ends up, I don't, I can't really tell you, I'm obviously not a seer, but at the same point, you know, we will generate, you know, about three point something million dollars. And again, that's because what comes through our door, we don't have a lot of control over. So in expenses, those are the things that we obviously do. I, I don't need to kind of tell you guys on a budget scenario, what, you know, how to do budget 101. But from that standpoint, most of our expenses that we're seeing in the general fund from those areas that uh, I talked about, the divisions, are in where we were at last year with the increase in our, um, uh, the, uh, the, the personnel uh, increases that were made. Sorry, yeah, I'll speak a little closer, thank you. It's so sensitive. Um, <laughs> so um, you'll see there in our personnel, um, again, our increases from last year is about 500000 uh, about $550,000. So that's the, inc most of that uh, bearing about $100,000 is from an increase of that market study. And again, our staff is very appreciative of that, th those increases. But the reality is, is that's obviously an increase that we have to absorb. All other areas, that not, uh, the non-personnel areas, obviously the, uh, everything else that we do besides capital, vehicles and so forth, that we've tried to reduce that. Uh, and uh, at the same point, we've only had a $5,000 increase. Basically, our, our capital in the general fund is vehicles. We have to replace our vehicles. Uh, we have building inspectors doing miles and miles of inspection uh, wear on these vehicles. Uh, every day. So we need to make sure we keep our fleet uh, maintained and repaired. It gets to a certain point and we have to replace it. So we've got a replacement schedule in place. Um, and from that point, you know, it, 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 we, we did not replace vehicles in, you know, the, in the 2000s, the 2010s and so forth because we didn't have the available uh, money to do so. So we've, last year we did four, four vehicles, next year we'll do four and the following year we'll be doing about two after that. So we've kind of gotten back through where we need to go and then we look at it, replacing about two vehicles every year. So that is our ex sort of on the expenses side. On the um, stormwater side, um, I'll just briefly go through from there. Um, we are just uh, expenses wise, we've reduced some expenses, um, mainly because we've uh, eliminated some summer help that we did not need the last couple of years. We had it in the budget and we just decided to take that out. It wasn't necessary, that saved us about $60,000. So from there, um, again, it's, it's um, we, there was also some uh, projects that we did last year that, uh, again, moved off of the books on the capital side of things. So we're a little less on that side, on the stormwater side. Um, from there, uh, I can go through the numbers if you'd like for water rotary, but, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot that's involved in there. There's a small increase. Again, both stormwater and also the uh, water rotary. Uh, there are also some increases in personnel expenses as well. So a, a slight increase in either one of those. So again, to, to reiterate um, some of the things that I just said, our, our uh, non-personnel budget is down. Our, um, our uh, uh, again, the uh, increase to the market rate um, is, uh, in, there are obviously impacts to that. Uh, 
Uh, we have, um, one of the things that I wanted to point out, we have increased uh, or requested uh, one and a half positions. And you might ask, why do we get one and a half, you know, from there? Well, we have different, fun uh, again, explained earlier, we have different funding mechanisms. And one of those positions is an accountant. And, uh, and I have to thank uh, Ann Jurgens. She's our fiscal officer. Uh, I have an operations coordinator besides that, but that's the only person that I have working on our fiscal area right now. And with uh, over $11 million in budget and so forth and multiple funds, um, to, and obviously having audits come in from the state that we have to ask, answer for, uh, it's just a lot to be able to try to keep up and so forth. So we have one position which is split between community development funding and also general fund from there. The other position that I have is development services. And one of the things you may remember from last year me talking about is the model zoning code that we've been working on, and it should be complete this year. Um, our expectation from that model zoning code is that we are going to get additional communities reaching out to us to ask for the, to work on their zoning codes uh, so that they can redo their zoning codes. It, it's obviously money that they have to put out to uh, make uh, to uh, redo their zoning code, have a consultant come in. Um, but they have also reached out to me to ask me, hey, we, can you do our zoning code for us? Can you uh, administer it? And the answer has been, we cannot do that. We A few years ago, we took on a community. And from there, it was, as my zoning administrator said, it was one community too many at that time. But we took it on, and from there, it, it has been a, a good thing, but we are a little overcome from that. And so, enabled to us to add additional capacity on from the zoning side, from an administration standpoint, uh, we, we would need an additional zoning uh, person in there to help plans examination and uh, from there to go through the interpretation. We have four separate zoning codes. We only have one building code. So from there, adding an additional zoning code makes it fairly difficult. It's one additional set of regulations that you have to go through and have to interpret. So the request is, uh, as we anticipate a, a building a capacity within our zoning area, our development services area, um, that we have an additional person, a person that comes on board, uh, that then we can add, uh, and of course, maintain what we've got currently, which is fairly difficult, and then also uh, to be able to add additional communities. And like I said, I've had several communities ask me, hey, when can we, when can we start you know, having you do our zoning? And uh, I said, it's going to take a bit of time to get to that point, but this would be an assistance to that. So that's the one and a half positions. Again, the accountant position to separate uh, between the half uh, and also the full-time uh, position, which is uh, in the development services area. So um, from there, I've talked about the uh, vehicles uh, and uh, our new electronic permitting system, which I didn't mention. I always will try to say that. We are continuing to work on that, and that would uh, looks to be likely now in the beginning portion of next year coming online. Again, that may uh, spur additional communities to come forth uh, once we get that in place. So our challenges. Same thing as I said last year, we've, uh, it's been very helpful, obviously, with the market rate adjustments. Uh, from, from there, we've been able to fill some positions, but we, like a lot of other people, we still need to fill positions, and we still have positions that are out there. So building plans examiner is always a difficult one to, for us to fill. Uh, uh, we also have uh, building inspectors, and we also are looking for a project engineer in the stormwater area. So we have a few more. They're listed on, on the county's website for availability, and, but those are the biggest challenges that we have. I try to be brief, I try to be loud um, and clear at the same point and try not to talk too fast. So from there, I am available for your questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, just a, well, I think just one comment as we look at, as you were saying, the market rate adjustment study that we did, the board was adamant about making sure the people that were working here were earning uh, good money. Um, and so we did a huge study in every department. So we basically, I, I would say, bite the bullet on the fact that having found out through the study that we were below some other areas, um, it ended up with us over a half a million in your area, uh, $548,890 more uh, to uh, fulfill this market rate study that we did. And so that's a lot of money. 
Um, and so um, I don't know what the average increase, it depends on each classification, so I won't even ask you that, but uh, we were determined that we wanted to, to bring it up, and so this is what we get. Um, and so as we look at our full budget, we have to, and that's promised, we're not taking that back, but we look at our full budget, and I'm sure it's going to impact our entire budget um, tremendously. So, But thank you for your information. Great. Vice President Reese. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, question on the ones that they should talk about challenges and fill in those uh, vacancies. Um, I guess I got two questions on that. In your budget, are these positions already budgeted in? Those, those positions uh, that I'm listing there, they are already in our, our uh, budget. So um, and one of the things is, you know, we obviously have our budget, um, but being able to, um, uh, we've had a lot of vacancies this last year. So, you know, we don't end up, you know, spending a lot of our personnel budget. So uh, those positions that are listed here are, uh, are on our this year's personnel budget and into next year. All right, so the ones that the one and a half positions, that's in our budget for 2023. I, does that answer? Yes, I believe it does. And the, when, in the vacancy, what did you do? You rolled it over for this year? So, for, you, correct, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, we have to put, uh, when the vacancy's out there, we usually put it at the highest amount from, from there. The reality is, is that the highest amount, the, the employee that comes in isn't going to be the highest amount, you know, from there. But we're always, we want to be conservative when we give you a, an estimate in our budget. So, from there, uh, those positions are assumed to be filled from there. There is a vacancy, uh, a th I think, believe a 3% that's kind of baked into here, you know, the, the budgets to say, look, we anticipate that, that you're going to be 3% vacant in your position through the year. Our vacancy rate as of last year, you know, I'll have to check. I know last year when we were here was roughly about 20%. It's less than that, but it's definitely a lot more than 3%. It's probably around 10 to 15 percent if I had to go on there. I know that we have multiple positions. We have several community development jobs as well. So. I know that uh, our, our vacancy rate is probably uh, upwards beyond 10%. So those are kind of put in there. But, you know, at the end of the year, we're, you know, if we don't spend that money on the personnel, it's going to go back into the general fund. But we want to make sure that it's uh, there and available um, to us. Gotcha. And I guess uh, less of a budgeting question, you listed as challenges. Do you have are you going to do something different this year, or is there something you're looking to do to try to help uh, fill these vacancies? Yeah, I mean, I know the normal, but yeah, is I there mean, something else that so, needs to happen? So there, um, you know, we try to do a little bit of everything, right, to, um, you know, whether it's uh, um, it's social media to try to, you know, pass those on to various folks. We're trying to, the, the county has an uh, EAC program that, uh, that's been great in trying to uh, entice folks, you know, to kind of spread the word of mouth by saying, hey, we've got a great uh, place to work. And from that standpoint, we do these great things. Internally, we're trying to do some of those things, you know, to try to make it a good place. I mean, the best way we get employees is word of mouth and being able to help them. You should work here. And so this is a great great place to be. So creating that environment, those are things that we can control and I try to work with my team, my leadership team, to try to, you know, spread the word, try to do, you know, things which will make this and plan development a great place to work and also Hamilton County a great place to work. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Yeah, just a, just to quickly comment on that. So, yeah, with the market rate adjustments, hopefully will help you. Um, address some of the challenges that's been mentioned in the tuition reimbursement and the parental leave policy and you know some of the other things that the board has put in place to try to not only attract um, new folks but also retain people uh, and keep them in the county structure so appreciate that I understand the impact to your budget here but we I think we all agree because we passed it that it's money well spent to try to um, get rid of your challenges, <laughs> you know, and the challenges I suspect are countywide challenges. So thank you for your work. Yeah, my pleasure. And I know folks who have taken advantage of uh, each one of those programs, and they're very thankful to have those in place. So 
thank you for you know obviously working on those things and continue to work as a board you know on those initiatives which will help us uh, to ga gain more employees and from that standpoint fit for these positions so thank you very much well, thank you. And the wage increases, of course, as we were saying, are, are really important. But even more so, people sometimes come for benefits. And we, Hamilton County has some of the greatest benefits in general. So people that are watching, you may want to just check out what the benefits are, too. So thank you so much for your presentation. For sure. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Conservation District, John Nelson. Commissioners. Mm -hmm. good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's uh, good to be here to present. Uh, hopefully mm -hmm. everyone, can, everyone can hear me. Um, so I just wanted to go um, through some of the slides, kind of talk about, um, you know, our budget request, but also kind of cover a little bit about our current year, how we're doing, and some of the pro projects that we do. Um, so just a little bit of a history um, of the conservation districts. There's one in every 88 counties. Uh, in in the state of Ohio, and it started in the 1930s as a response to the Dust Bowl and the environmental disaster that it was. Uh, so our district was formed in um, 1945. So we've been here serving Hamilton County uh, for over 75 years. Um, so you know we have a small team. So within the county um, umbrella, Hamilton County umbrella, we are one of the smaller teams. We've got 10 full-time employees and uh, one seasonal employee in the summer, and then uh, we're looking to fill one position for a part-time technician as well. Uh, so uh, by ORC, we are governed by a specially elected board, uh, Board of Supervisors, and uh, uh, this is our current board, and Laura Boyd, who is uh, one of our board members, is here as well this afternoon. Um, so this is a special election that happens every year, and we fill one to two positions, and it's a three-year term. And I directly report to the Board of Supervisors there. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about our current uh, makeup in terms of our budget. So this is our 2022 budget. You'll see 46% of our budget is actually made of, of the Stormwater District dollars that Lisa and Eric had talked about in their presentation. So we get almost a little less than a half of our budget from that stormwater district fund from the engineer's office over to us. So then we get a $290,000 subsidy from the general fund, which is matched by the state. So that match varies uh, from year to year. And that can be anywhere between 75 cents for a dollar all the way up to 85 cents for a dollar. So it varies on the total pool of money that other soil and water conservation districts are getting from general fund funds across the state as well. Uh, but generally it's within that 75 to 85 cents for a dollar, that percentage range. Um, so you'll see our expenses are pretty similar to our income. We try to be uh, good stewards of the, the dollars that we receive and we try to spend within our means. And you'll see that the makeup of our expenditure matches very closely to the budget income and how those incomes come as well. Uh, so apart from these, we also have other sources of revenue. Uh, we go out and seek very aggressively grants that helps the environment here in Hamilton County. Uh, so just to kind of give you an idea, I, I put a uh, compilation of grants that we received over three years. So these range from federal grants from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, private foundations like the Duke Energy Foundation um, and collaborative efforts like uh, Caring for Our Watersheds, which is a collaboration with private agency as well as uh, the Regional Stormwater Collaborative, Collaborative which is a partnership of uh, stormwater dis districts and soil and water conservation districts across the region. So that includes Northern Kentucky as well as four counties in Ohio as well. So all of that put together, we generate about half a million in a program funding via grants and collaborations over a three year period. So we try to be very, very fiscally responsible and try to stretch the dollars that we get locally and see how we can bring about the most impact here in Hamilton County. Um, and in terms of revenue, uh, our uh, earthworks program uh, and permitting, syst uh, permitting program actually generates revenues, but those revenues do not come to the district. It goes directly to, to the general fund. So in 2021, 
In earthwork permit fees and tech fees, we generated $251,000. A year to date, 2022, we've generated about $138,000 in revenue, and it looks like we'll be pretty close to what we generated last year uh, in terms of revenues. So what do we get for everything that we spend, the little, little under a million dollars that we spend? So we do robust conservation and environmental education. This includes classroom programs, library programs, adult education, online outreach. COVID really put a little bit of a... Um, you know, uh, impact on this, especially in 2020, we really couldn't get into classrooms. The classrooms became very hard for us to reach. So we went to virtual programming. We do a lot of videos, educational material that's available to all people online. Uh, and so that's one way that we've battled the pandemic. We do also extensive public involvement and volunteerism. We do uh, stream and neighborhood cleanups, live staking events where we're putting in tree cuttings in uh, stream banks, native tree sales, master rain gardener programs, soil testing programs for all of the Hamilton County residents. Uh, we also have some really groundbreaking watershed management pro projects. One is in Cooper Creek, which is in the Mill Creek watershed. Uh, this project has garnered national attention for the work that we're putting into that region. Uh, in fact, uh, US EPA highlighted this project in their newsletter, Science Matters. So we are uh, doing some groundbreaking work there. Uh, we're working with the Uni University of Cincinnati, US Fish and Wildlife, Ohio EPA, and just doing some amazing work there. Uh, that, there you see a picture of us doing a woody debris installation to help uh, reduce the pollutants within the streams as well. Uh, we're also working in an agricultural watershed in the upper Dry Fork watershed, which is part of the GMR, the Great Miami River. Uh, so that's work that's going on there as well, and we're doing a nine-element plan there for the watershed. Uh, we address issues like stream bank erosion, and uh, we also provide consults for nonprofits that are doing watershed work in our region as well. So we also promote sustainable agriculture. We work with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, bring the seasonal high tunnel project here to Cincinnati and uh, the surrounding communities where people can grow food outside of the regular growing season, uh, which addresses, of course, um, a lot of our food insecurity issues within our urban communities. Uh, we do cover crops for nitrogen and carbon sequestration and we support neighborhood farms and equip farmers with sustainability tools. Um, and of course, we just touched on the earthwork permitting. So part of the earthwork permitting is making sure that construction sites that are disturbing over an acre in township and select municipalities are monitored and made sure that they're not letting sediment leave that site uh, and that all of the sediment remains on the construction site, uh, which is a, a benefit to the residents that are around the, uh, the construction as well as to the environment and to our local streams. And then of course is permitting for geotechnical oversight as well in all of the townships to make sure that um, landslides are mitigated and if there's a high landslide potential uh, to a particular property that's being developed that it is uh, looked at by a geotechnical engineer. And then uh, homeowner consults for erosion and drainage. This is something that we've always done as a conservation district, and we still do that. So if homeowners call issues around drainage or erosion, we'll get on the phone, we'll talk to them. If need be, we'll even go out on site and provide a consult. So um, going on to 2023, what is our budget request? Very similar to uh, what we asked in 2022, the, the increase that we're asking in the general fund is we're asking $315,000. Uh, and the reason why you, uh, we have round numbers is because we don't know what we get from the state. So we just estimate and we go with the estimate on that. So you'll see that uh, from a uh, funding perspective, we've kind of remained stable across the board. So in 2021, we lost a watershed grant and uh, the commissioners were kind enough to help us cover that watershed grant that we lost. And then in 2023, we're asking for a little bit more um, uh, from 290 to 351, 15,000. So that's a $25,000 increase from the general fund. Um, so that's like a 8.6% increase from that 290,000. 
So let's talk about net impact on county general fund. In 2021, we generated those $251,000 to the county general fund. So we did not have an impact on the county general fund. In 2022, if we generate the same amount of revenue as 2021, our impact will be 40,000. And if approved, our impact in 2023 will be $65,000 on the county general fund. So what are we getting for the additional $25,000? That's the big question, right? Because you always want to explain what that value proposition is. And so, of course, the $25,000 that the commissioners are giving to us in addition will be matched by the state, which is another value to the residents of Hamilton County. So out of those $25,000, we're trying to do three major things. One is to we're preparing for the H2 Ohio grant dollars that are going to be coming to Hamilton County. So that is a state program that was um, piloted in Western Lake Erie Basin. And now the, the governor is trying to expand it to the entire state. There's over $200 million that is available to the whole state for watershed related projects. And we are trying to staff up so we would be ready to uh, accept those dollars, apply for those dollars when those dollars become available to Hamilton County. Uh, portions of that, those dollars have already become available to Hamilton County, and we work with our nonprofit partners to make sure those dollars have come. So we work with, uh, with uh, uh, Gorman Heritage Farm in Evendale to bring a w w wetland grant over to, to Gorman to be able to mitigate some watershed issues over there. So the big part of this money is, of course, what is coming, going to come from the Ohio Department of Agriculture, which has yet not come to Hamilton County. And so we are preparing to bring those dollars in. So this additional funding will, of course, help with us being able to staff up and prepare to bring those dollars in. Following the BOCC on the compensation and the benefit schedule, that's something that uh, James uh, touched on. And you know, we, our board is very, uh, very, um, clear that they want to follow the BOCC in the, in the compensation and the benefit schedule. And so our board would like to make sure that we match what the uh, BOCC has done for the BOCC departments in terms of compensation and benefits. And then, of course, the last item is rebuilding the geotechnical program from past budget cuts. So um, in the early part of uh, the 2010s, we had to uh, eliminate a geotechnical engineer position within our ranks because of budget cuts. So we'd like to reestablish a part-time geotechnical engineers uh, within our ranks to be able to do some of our permit-related works. So we're currently using a consultant, but we'd like to have a, ge a part-time geotechnical engineer on staff to be able to do those permits in-house for us, the permit reviews. So that's uh, my quick presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, and the geotechnical program, it's, um, which one is that? The name uh, it? So, uh, Madam President, that is to handle the concerns around landslides. So anytime there is a development that happens in the townships and it is in a high landslide potential, uh, so we'll, we'll require a geotechnical permit from them, and so they have to submit a letter from a geotechnical engineer mm -hmm. and a plan, and our geotechnical engineer will then review it and say, this is okay to go ahead uh, per your plan. And basically, the geotechnical engineer that is submitting the plan signs off on the plan as well. So. And what is the name of the other program that you guys uh, monitor and you look over? over the oversight of the real estate in the area the okay. sediment erosion control yeah. portion okay. yeah okay. so that is a requirement of the uh, national stormwater permit mm -hmm. so as part of the national stormwater permit uh, we're required to do six minimum controls within Hamilton County uh, public education outreach which is what mm -hmm. uh, the education portion of what we do there is illicit discharge health does that uh, and then there is um, good housekeeping, which is also health, and then planning and development does the post-construction. Um, so we do the pre-construction. So when a site is being actively developed, we make sure that all the pollutants that are generated on that site remain on site. Okay. So. Very good. And if correct me if I'm wrong, I'm looking at your, um, your pie chart on the budgeted income, uh, the county general fund, 290. And then, as you were saying earlier, you guys give back tax revenue of 251000 which um, so actually you're giving back money. We're only short 
like 40,000. That is correct, Madam okay. President. So yeah, so uh, in 2021, we only received $250,000. And so we actually added a revenue of $1,190 in permit fees and technology fees. Uh, in 2020, if we stay on correct track, would only our impact will only be 40,000, and with the the requested amount in uh, 2023, it'll be 65,000. If we current stay with the current trends of permits. Okay. Um, my last question: the H2 Ohio grant. Uh, what percentage do we have to put in once the state? agrees to give us that grant, how much do we have to put in? So Madam President, that is uh, actually completely uh, funded by the state. So the way that program works is that we have to work with individual landowners mm -hmm. to um, get get individual landers, landowners to come up with conservation plans. Uh, it could be agricultural, it could be conservation areas, but basically make them uh, apply for it and then bring those dollars in. And the local conservation district will hold those dollars and will hold those, uh, you know, those projects and manage those projects and make sure they're properly installed. So it will be actual dollars that will be coming into private landowners that want to implement watershed management projects. This will help our farmers who are um, growing crops in the western side of Hamilton County. So like uh, uh, um, concepts like putting in uh, cover crop, which helps with carbon and nitrogen sequestration, which will help battle issues like climate change and things like that as well. So. So when you say to prepare for those grant dollars to come in, I thought it meant to add additional money, but you're saying prepare the staff to be ready for when we're awarded that grant. Uh, Madam okay. President, that is correct. So one of the words that we've received from the state constantly is shovel ready projects. Mm -hmm. So they want to, they want us to be ready with projects that have already been, uh, you know, reach a certain sa sa stage of planning. So when the dollars come, they want us to hit the ground running. So we're kind of preparing to that end result. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Vice President Brace. Thank you for your presentation. And um, I also want to, um, we had to work on the volume. And I, I don't remember having to be this close to the microphone to be heard. So we check on that after today. But um, I want to thank one of your board members you said that's here today. Thank you for being here. Um, you talked about a special election every year, so this is um, my first uh, presentation for budget from your, de your department or your division. Talk about that. What is the special election? What is that? So, uh, uh, Madam Commissioner, the, the closest thing that I can think of is something to the effect like of a par park board, so to speak. You know, so the Ohio Revised Code requires that they, uh, there be a special election every year and the election is basically run by the Ohio Department of Agriculture uh, from the state and uh, you know our office staff provides some kind of support uh, towards that so it's announced in the local um, news and basically the, um, uh, the, the current board puts together a nominating committee that's made of two board members and two members from the community and together they basically pick a nomination slate but there's also opportunity for anyone to uh, petition to be on the, the ballot as well. And so then uh, it's the election is advertised and I believe there's a 30-day uh, voting period where residents of Hamilton County can vote to, um, to, to pick their candidate to sit on the, the Conservation District's board. Okay, and where I've been a resident of, of Hamilton County, uh, no one, I've never participated in a voting for this position, and I tend to not miss voting. So my question is, how are we getting this message out? If there's people that are watching now, and uh, like myself, this was yeah. news to me, uh, I don't know where they promote it, where are you vote, are you going to the Board of Elections to vote, where are you voting, how do you get in, if someone wants to get involved, and, I, and obviously I want to vote next time. Yeah, Commissioner Reese, thank you so much for that, that really shines light uh, on our election process, and we really like to get more votes and more involvement from our residents, so we actually uh, put out a, um, a press release, but we'll also do advertising in our local newspapers as well, because that's required by Ohio Revised Code, and that's how we do it. That's uh, it's it's archaic, but that's the way it's been done for many many years. And so, till the Revised Codes get changed, that seems to be our main form of advertising. 
Um, but um, the easiest way for somebody to participate in our voting process would be either to call the office or go to our website and request a ballot and they can request a ballot and a ballot will be mailed to them and they can send uh, e uh, e uh, mail the ma ballot back to the office. Uh, so that will be absentee ballot uh, voting and then there will be some list of areas where they can do in-person voting as well and they can always stop by the office for in-person voting as well. Got you. I'd like to know more about that. So maybe if you can send something. Um, I don't know if the other board members already know, but please, I'd like to get more information about this. I'd like to get the word out. I want to um, have more participation. Um, and you're right. Um, newspapers is great, but also there's other ways. And we have a very uh, active website now. I mean, we've got, I think, almost over 200,000 people have been on our website. So any way we could get the word out so that more people know about this. I think it's very important, and I like to see more people participating in voting and more people participating in running Absolutely. for uh, this position. So thank you. I learned something new today from your presentation. Um, wanted to go back to your, um, your budget request. You said 25000 additional dollars, but earlier in your presentation you indicated that you uh, – you wanted more because you didn't know what the state was going to do, but then you came back and said, and maybe I misunderstood, the 25000 would get us more money from the state. Yeah, C Commissioner, that, that um, let me clarify a little bit on that. So you, you, sometimes it's a little bit confusing because we give round numbers in terms of her request, which is kind of odd uh, to see round numbers like that. And the reason uh, it's a round number is we don't know what we're going to get from the state. We use a percentage to estimate what we might receive from the state. So we will certainly receive some money from the state, but we don't know if it is 75 cents on a dollar or 85 cents on a dollar or somewhere in between. So that changes from year to year. Okay, but you indicated that the twenty-five thousand will get you additional money from yes, the state. Yes, so that's that is correct. That's, so okay, so because we give a larger number, then they will give a larger number. That is Only correct. Every reason I'm asking because I came from the state, so I'm trying to understand yes, your uh, commissioner Reese. That is a hundred percent correct. So the the bigger the number the commissioners give us, the bigger the number we get from the state as well. Okay, yeah. and then also uh, you named some of the activities. I'm sure you gave us a brief analysis. It seems like a lot of great work that you all are doing. Um, you mentioned the uh, USDA seasonal uh, tunnel and the neighborhood farm. Uh, my question is also, are you doing any work with Central State Extension? Uh, Amber Twitty, um, I know, has been doing a lot around this area through the Central State Extension, and I'm always concerned about that. That was one of my major projects was uh, Central State, just like Ohio State have an extension program. Um, so just wanted to know, are you doing any collaboration with them? Yes, 100%. So uh, we love Central State Extension. They're just such a dynamic group, and they're really uh, changing things up. We've worked with OSU Extension for many, many years, but we are so happy to work with uh, Central State Extension because they're just bringing so much fresh, fresh energy to the entire conservation uh, industry and the program here in Southwest Ohio. So. Uh, currently, most of the work that Central State is doing is more um, upstream, um, closer to home to Central State, um, but our partners in Warren County work very closely with Central State, and we are hoping to partner with that a little bit in that that uh, part of our stormwater budget next year, we're actually planning to bring an AmeriCorps volunteer program to Hamilton County. And as part of it is we're working with some of our neighboring soil and water conservation districts to also place AmeriCorps volunteers in various uh, surrounding soil and water conservation districts. And if that grant gets funded, uh, then one of the placements will be in, um, in Warren County working very closely with CSU professors on uh, uh, water quality data collection. So. Gotcha. Yeah, I just wonder, because they are doing a lot of neighborhood farms on the west side of town, I understand. Okay. Um, so I'd like to see that partnership. We're really trying to get more, as yourself, diversity in this area Absolutely. to kind of grow up and make this kind of part of the DNA, and it's hard um, from the urban perspective. So I wanted to make sure, as we're moving to this next budget, 
that there's something in there that would encourage this. And then lastly, we are focused a lot on internships. Um, we've got a paid internship program uh, that's current, and I think we'll hopefully have one next year. But I'd like to see some kind of internship partnership with uh, your department, Central State, and others uh, to try to get folks in this uh, type of business, this type of work. Um, so just wanted to make sure that that is part of your plan as well with internships and opportunities because different departments are offering the internships. Yeah. We've already funded it. Yeah. M M Madam Commissioner, that's uh, definitely our plan. I've uh, already talked with uh, Director Spatero, and we plan to be a partner in that, uh, in that fellowship program as well. Uh, but as part of AmeriCorps program, we're hoping to also uh, a, a little introduction about the AmeriCorps program. So anyone that graduates from a college program and actually uh, works for a year in AmeriCorps will actually get some dollars that they can use for a student loan to pay off their student loan. Mm -hmm. and, and it also gets them some benefits to go on for higher education as well. So it's, it's going to be a, 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 a huge blessing to a lot of our college students in the region, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And um, those are all the questions that I have, Madam President. Thank you. Commissioner Treehouse. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, John. Um, so just one quick question, and I'm focused on the graphic with the hill slide, or the landslide. Um, so are you seeing more of this uh, landslide activity or getting more calls than you have in the past? Commissioner Driehaus, we've been tracking that data, uh, and it's it's hard to tell because um, most of it, it depends on the weather patterns for a particular year. So, say for example, we get a lot of snow and the ground is extremely saturated, and then we get um, a lot of rain followed by a heavy snow year. Then we get a lot of landslides because of the sheer saturation of the soils. Um, but like, for example, this year we had a very dry early spring, so we didn't see as many calls that were landslide related. So a lot, of course, is determined on weather pattern. And of course, given climate change, it's almost unpredictable anymore. You know, it's we go in and we, we can't tell what each year is going to do. You know, we're seeing uh, really cooler, cooler temperatures in August, which is unreal. So it's just hard to predict anymore. There's not a pattern uh, with uh, how rainfall and snow activity temperatures work anymore, which is truly a challenge for our staff because in the past we could almost ramp up and we could prepare our staff for what might be a pretty rainy spring and a rainy fall, um, but we don't have those luxuries anymore. And so that seems to be the, more of the challenge. Um, not so much the increased number, but the unpredictability of these occurrences. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank Appreciate you so much, it. Commissioners. Uh -huh. Our next speaker would be uh, Brad Johnson, Environmental Services. Welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks again. It's always a pleasure to be here in front of the board to uh, go over uh, what we do and um, the, the absolute wonderful staff that we have. And uh, like you said, I'm Brad Johnson. I'm the director of Hamilton County Environmental Services. So uh, last time I saw you just a couple of weeks ago, I was able to give you a brief update uh, on what we do. So the good news is I don't have to do that today. I can kind of go right into the budget since I am the last one and uh, round it out and get through this for you. Um, the, the main thing to understand with us is that we uh, are not part of the general fund. All of our funding is restricted, so we are kind of a, a standalone agency when it comes to our funding. So I'll kind of give you a breakdown. I'll show you some pie charts on how that works out. Um, but uh, the other thing is that um, just remember that Hamilton County Resource, their mission is to reduce the amount of waste going to the landfill, and that is exclusive to just Hamilton County. Now our Southwest Ohio Air Quality Agency, like I said last time, uh, we serve the five counties in the Southwest Ohio region. Uh, so a couple of things, the, what you're seeing in front of you today from the budget office, I believe is just our resource budget. So I'll be going through that, but I also wanted to give you a quick overview of the Southwest Ohio Air Quality Agency budget too. 
it's a little more complicated, and I thought it would be important to kind of show you where our funding comes from and uh, kind of, you know, explain some of our past challenges and where we're going. So the main thing to look at here that I wanted to show with the numbers is that you can see both of our um, uh, estimated uh, revenues are actually below uh, what our expenditures are. So the good news there is if you've not seen, we have a carryover, pretty substantial carryover in both, uh, both of those agencies. And I'll kind of discuss that a little bit more as we go through this. So starting with resource, which you have in front of you, and thanks, John, for mentioning that some of these numbers are just a few dollars off. Uh, ours is a little bit more updated, so if you do see some discrepancies, that's what that is. The good news is the revenue side for resource uh, continues to be very straightforward and simple. Um, if you're not familiar, we collect those fees through uh, state mandates, uh, I'm sorry, state uh, code that went back in the uh, late 80s, and we get tipping fees. So every ton that crosses uh, landfills here in Hamilton County, we get a $1 fee if it's in district, $2 if it's out of district, and if it's out of state, because of interstate uh, laws, we have to match it with the $1. So that's how we generate those fees. You can see a slight little sliver up there at the top. Um, it's actually below 1%. What that is, is uh, ORC, the Ohio Revised Code requires, uh, there's 10 categories that we have to fall within for spending. One of those programs, we actually wanted to help out uh, the health district a little bit. So when we have an environmental enforcement officer out, a deputy sheriff, he has the ability to do some things to help health out, and we have to make sure we get reimbursed for that to follow that Ohio Revised Code. So as far as the expenditure, there's a couple of things I really wanted to point out because uh, you both, uh, you deal with these. So uh, you can see the majority of that pie chart shows that is grant funding. And again, keep in mind that our mission is to reduce the amount of waste going to the landfills. So I know Commissioner Driehaus is very uh, familiar with this being on the policy committee, uh, but we really encourage these grants. It's kind of a seed money to get businesses and other places in the county the opportunity to um, put the infrastructure in place to reduce waste and to continue that. So I very much appreciate the board always being supportive of those when we bring those down. Um, Next year, uh, we actually have uh, $500,000 set aside. And I know Commissioner Driehaus, again, is very familiar with this. One of the complaints that, not complaints, but one of the things we've heard from the communities is we don't have a substantial amount of money beyond our $10,000 waste reduction innovation grant. So next year, we have $500,000 set aside to help out with larger projects. So that might be uh, food waste. We've talked a lot about food waste. Say there's a business that wants to purchase a bunch of freezers to hold that, that food material prior to it going to a, uh, uh, like La Soup or some type of food kitchen, that would be an opportunity for a business like that to submit. Another one would be, uh, there's been uh, an interest with, we have a great partner with recycling in Rumkey here in Hamilton County. However, hard to recycle materials, we don't have a good resource right now for that. So that might be another opportunity and I think uh, we have some applicants that'll be excited about that. So personnel, um, you can see personnel is low compared. I'll show you our Southwest Ohio Air personnel. So we're right around a quarter of that, but you can kind of see how it breaks out um, the administrative overhead and the smaller pieces there. Oh, the health department. So if you're not familiar, we do hire the health department to do the enforcement. So the health department's the one that actually goes out to the landfills, the transfer stations, all the solid waste related facilities and does those inspections on our behalf. So kind of the quick highlights of the resource budget, um, you can see that only uh, we have 13 full-time employees. Uh, other than the, uh, the impact grant I just discussed, there's not a whole lot of change. Um, Commissioner Driehaus, you know, we, we're looking right now, the policy committee, about household hazardous waste. You can see there, that's the orange down there. So it's 5% of our budget, and it only impacts less than 1% of the population. So we're looking, how can we improve that? Um, and then there's been a lot of talk about electric vehicles. I just wanted to stress that uh, Environmental Services has been on board with this um, for over a year now. Uh, we've been working to get the infrastructure in place, and we are budgeted to purchase a uh, van, electric van, <coughs> next year. So moving on to Southwest Ohio Air Quality Agency, like I said, the revenue is substantially different. Um, I kind of wanted to show, it's, it's hard to see the text, but the main thing to understand there 
is, and I've told you this, is that most of our funding comes from directly from US EPA and Ohio EPA because we serve as a contractor in a lot of ways for them. And the way to break it out, I, we actually have it broken out by the type of program, um, but 41% of our revenue comes from, from Ohio EPA, 41% comes from US EPA, 6% comes from the Department, Department of Homeland Security, and then 3%, we actually do work for a company up in Middletown that has some uh, emission things that they need a uh, third party to do, so we do that on their behalf. And then um, the last piece, and it's important to understand, the, the purple there, uh, that is local dollars. That's the only one that we have control over here in Hamilton County. We don't have much control over what Ohio EPA and US EPA uh, provides us when it comes to their contracts and the agreements. And unfortunately, that's been flat, and in some areas, Title V, that's gone down. So I'll give you kind of a little bit of a long-term picture on that too. And then expenditure. So you can see the big difference here from resource. Our personnel, being a regulatory agency, you can imagine most of our expense comes to the personnel. So uh, over 60% there. Much larger, again, personnel's the biggest uh, expense that we have. So we have 38 full-time employees there. Again, no significant programmatic changes from uh, last year's budget. Um, I have mentioned this already, but I'll mention it again. Uh, we did a pilot this year on the Mo Greener program where you get a rebate if you um, purchase an EV, I'm sorry, an electric mower as opposed to an uh, internal combustion engine mower. And uh, we actually, that was so successful, Ohio EPA gave us an additional $50,000 to implement that program again this year. And again, electric vehicle, we're budgeted for electric vehicle in that agency. And uh, as far as challenges and um, benefits, I did want to thank the board for the market adjustment. I know it's been brought up a couple of times. Last year, well, for several years, we were really struggling with uh, bringing new people on board. The good news is, is that we had a lot of um, senior level employees who had been with us for 30 years. So um, one of the reasons we had a surplus is because we were able to be lean during that time. And now, as we're getting more people to retire, we put out all these jobs. And the good news is the market adjustment has really, really helped us. And to um, Madam President, to your point, the um, parental leave, tuition reimbursement, all my younger staff have expressed how grateful they are for that. So that's made a big impact. Um, and as far as challenges in the future, Again, we're balanced with the carryover, but those local fees, that is something we're probably gonna have to look at at some point because that, that fee was established back in the 90s and we are by far the lowest in the, the state of Ohio when it comes to um, what we charge for those permitting fees. So um, before I go to questions, I did wanna thank um, Ali Kodadad, he's my operations manager. Phenomenal, he'll be here Thursday. He's uh, 30 years this week uh, mm -hmm. with the county and, and at our department, so just phenomenal. I, it's such a relief to have someone like Ali uh, you know, looking over the books and making sure we plan out long-term appropriately. And I also wanna thank uh, Holly Christman. She's my predecessor in this role and she left me uh, with a, a surplus, <laughs> which I mean, that was a difficult thing to do, Holly. She made a lot of difficult decisions when she was the director. So thank you, Holly. That's awesome, yeah. Um, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Um, if you could just clarify for, uh, for me. Sure. Um, on the one uh, pie chart, you have 4% for administrative overhead <clears throat> and then personnel is 26%. I know you mentioned about the health department. Are they part of that administrative overhead? No. Okay. No, so. that's uh, strictly a uh, contract agreement that we have for them to do those inspections, so that it would not be a part of that. Okay. So I was just wondering, why did you separate the pie? That's why. Uh, so what it, what it is, is that the state of Ohio, um, they encourage especially um, waste districts that have mm -hmm. uh, a large landfill facility, compost facilities, which we have several class four composts here. Uh, the Ohio EPA does do inspections, but quite honestly, they don't do enough. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do is we hire uh, the local health department, in this case, uh, Greg Kesterman's staff, 
to actually go out and they'll, they'll do at a minimum a monthly inspection at Rumpke. They're out checking those compost facilities. So that's what that is. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for all your hard work. Oh, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Vice President Reese. Thank you for your um, presentation, uh, both uh, this week and last week. And <laughs> um, Thursday, too. And you're back again. For, I, I want to recognize Allie. <laughs> for good news that day. No, this is not bad news. This is good news. Um, I, I just wanted to take a step back to say uh, your presentation last week, uh, I know you had to leave, but um, I had indicated that it showed that Hamilton County is ahead of the curve and uh, is a leader. And I think that um, the gentleman, um, although we, we did join the resolution, but I think we're bringing a lot to the table. And I could see in his eyes when you were presenting and others were presenting, he was like, wow. And I think it can help other counties. So I just wanted to highlight, uh, it just seemed like we're just ahead of the curve with new, new and innovative things and ideas. My, um, my question is not necessarily on just this budget, but as we look at the budget and we look at what our goal is for the department, um, are we looking equally at a pie chart to show that this is the impact we're making? You know, this is, for example, with the food conservation, I know that's new, but showing like, here's where we were, here's where we are, whenever that, you know, might need more than a year, obviously. Uh, but I think um, that, I'm sure you're doing it, but it would just be helpful to Absolutely. highlight it um, even more. That really, with the, the, the light bulb went off with me, is that maybe we're not highlighting this enough. Uh, we showed up for one presentation, but maybe we need to do more and get it out more um, because some people only beat you through marketing, and I'm a marketer, so they run with a marketing thing, and we might be doing all the work, but we're not marketing ourselves as much, even though we've got our own Instagram and YouTube, and, but to establish ourselves with we are number one. This is what we stand for, and kind of pushing that on an ongoing basis throughout all of our messaging. So just wanted to say maybe we can... Um, collaborate a little bit more and be able to put it out in different spaces uh, because from what I heard last week we are or the week before we are leading in a lot of these areas uh, we just might not have a press conference about it so just wanted to uh, say that uh, thank you for your work and your presentation was very good thank you well I appreciate that's music to my ears because one of my personal goals uh, when I took this role three and a half years ago, was to put more of a spotlight on the work that we do. And you're 100% right that uh, that is an area that we can improve. Um, so what we do is everything we do, we actually take before measurements and after measurements. So to your point, that is something I've implemented uh, from day one where we do them as quality improvement projects to make sure that we can show. And some of these are not easy, right? It's difficult to figure out well, what is the measure you take before and after to show success. And sometimes you have to take multiple, but I, I, I appreciate that. And I can tell you my staff will love to hear that because I've never seen such passion that uh, a staff brings to the kind of work we do. Um, you know, a lot of the staff have um, master's degrees. So they've spent their entire um, educational career building to get to where they are today. And they should be proud of the work they do. So it's my job as director to make sure that gets recognized. So I appreciate your support. I'll be uh, taking advantage of that. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Brad, for the presentation. Um, yeah, I just, I don't have any questions other than to note that um, this department, along with solid waste, are doing things and reacting to things that we see in the community. Uh, the hazardous waste program is a good example of that, where uh, we have a goal to reduce hazardous waste going into landfill. And if we have a program that's probably not the best approach, then we're nimble enough to recognize that and adjust. And that's what you do. Um, that's what Michelle Balls does. And so I think um, that's very important as we move into an area with environmental services where the technology is changing constantly, uh, we need to be nimble and recognize that we also need to be changing constantly. So I just want to um, 
note that that you're, you're doing that and recognize um, in a positive way that that's kind of the approach to the budget and all things related to environmental services. And, and I too, you know, we had that great presentation um, with uh, trying to create a baseline so that we all understand what we are doing related to the environment and moving into that space, whether it's facilities or your department and others. And um, I too am looking forward to doing more and relying on you in many ways and your staff or your expertise in this area to bring to us your ideas as to how we can do better as a county um, as we try to get more green. So um, you look forward to a continuing dialogue Absolutely. with you Thanks and your for team. The words. Yeah, Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you so much for your presentation. You're welcome. All righty, and we'll have more presentations at our next uh, Tuesday meeting. Um, okay. Moving forward, uh, next item on the agenda is American Rescue Plan update. Holly Chrisman, Assistant Administrator, as you know, on uh, the public that's watching, we got a tremendous amount of um, money from the federal government to disperse due to this COVID-19 um, I don't know disease that's we're hoping that we'll be uh, flattening more as we listen to our commissioner and, and um, our health commissioner but I think we've done a great I know we've done a great job as administration and as a board to distribute these money so Holly's going to speak more to it great mm -hmm. thank you good afternoon this will be very quick I just wanted to give a high-level overview of how we have spent our American rescue plans to date and upcoming initiatives we'll be launching shortly. So just as a refresher for those watching, um, Hamilton County received 158 million in American Rescue Plan dollars, and we can use them for these four purposes. Um, the board has authorized um, and, and passed an allocation plan to divvy those funds up, the majority of which will be going to um, address the negative economic impacts of the pandemic. And I'll go through these in a little more detail. Uh, this is hard to see, so I apologize for that, but just wanted to show you, this is what was reported to U.S. Treasury about a uh, month ago. Um, through June 30th, we have spent almost $40 million um, of the 158. And I'll go through a little bit in detail about each program and the results. So as the board knows, um, we budgeted $7.6 million for nonprofit assistance, and we've partnered with the United Way to help us distribute those funds. And to date, we spent almost six and a half million on two rounds of grants. Uh, we've provided 79 nonprofits with funding. And per the board's direction, we are finishing up a third round of grant applications targeted to the smaller nonprofits. So those with um, half a million dollars or less in annual revenues. We anticipate receiving the list from United Way on their recommendations in the next couple of weeks. But we did have 34 applicants, which we're really happy to see, um, requesting right around $900,000, so within the remaining budget. Uh, future reporting on the nonprofits will include outcomes of the grant funds that were provided. Um, the small business grant and the board's very up to date on this. Um, we have done three rounds total. That's both CARES and the American Rescue Plan. The stats up here are just the funding spent with the American Rescue Plan dollars. So it was 2.9 million, over 320 grants were awarded. And you can see, and I know this board um, emphasized this, was to really focus on the smaller small businesses. And I think we really hit the mark with our partner Alloy on this, where 90% of the grants funded through the American Rescue Plan went to those businesses with 10 employees or less. So we're really happy about that. Um, I know, again, the board's aware we provided um, almost two million in grants to the arts and cultural organizations. We did this through a partnership with ArtsWave, um, who um, administered the grant on our behalf. And you may recall, um, according to ArtsWave, our arts and cultural organizations had about $140 million revenue loss because of the pandemic. So these grants, um, you can see a quote from ArtWorks, were um, very much appreciative by the 53 organizations that received this funding. Now we've already mentioned testing today during the meeting. Um, this board did authorize us to enter into a contract with Ethos Labs to provide no cost PCR testing. So this is not the rapid test that you can get at your um, local grocery store or, or free at your libraries. These are the PCR tests that appear, are more accurate. So we have three sites right now. Um, 
Coryville and Price Hill Libraries, as well as Quinn Chapel in Forest Park. Um, we have just entered into an amendment with Ethos to allow for, um, to pay for the testing for those who don't have insurance at two other sites that are existing, and that's the Crossroads site as well as the Urban League. So that will be happening shortly. So you can see testing was, you know, pretty steady. You'll probably see in July and August the numbers jumped up a little bit for obvious reasons. Uh, the mortgage program, again, we started this back in last fall. This is administered through Job and Family Services. We have spent just about 700000 on the program so far, and this does include some of the technology upgrades we had to make to the application process. But we have, uh, through June, helped 217 households with their mortgage, utility, and um, property tax payments. Now, we are working with an agency, um, voice of your customer to who is looking at doing some very targeted outreach in the coming weeks. So we do anticipate these numbers increasing. Um, moving now towards kind of the internal operations, the bulk of the funding that we have spent so far is on revenue replacement. You may recall that under the CARES Act, we couldn't do revenue replacement under the American Rescue Plan. We are allowed to, which was a great um, addition. We have budgeted 32 million for revenue replacement. We have accessed 25 of that so far, which has been uh, used to offset um, general government salaries, primarily courts and public safety. Also looking internally, you know, an eligible use is premium pay. I think the board is aware. Um, we've provided $1,000 payments to eligible workers doing essential work as defined by US Treasury. And those payments have been made. We're also working closely and continue to work with the Emergency Management Agency to fund the warehouse that is storing all the personal protective equipment, the masks, the gowns, the gloves, um, and you can see how much we've spent to date there. And lastly, we have obviously administrative costs and some consulting costs that we um, undertook over the past year. That includes internal staffing as well as some compliance consulting uh, we brought on board. And I do want to thank, before I go to my last slide, um, I think everyone's met Sarah Adams. Um, she was brought on in April to help administer the American Rescue Plan, has been an absolute joy to work with, and incredibly helpful launching all of these programs. <clears throat> so what's coming up? Well, we've got a lot. This is over the next about month time frame. Um, actually, this Thursday, we're requesting a by-leave resolution to enter into an agreement with Strategies to End Homelessness to expand the Shelter Diversion Program. Uh, also on Thursday's agenda is an MOU uh, with Hamilton County Public Health to administer uh, some sewer infrastructure project in the Kenwood Acres area to help fix some cross connections there. We also had applications were due last week from healthcare providers to help mitigate COVID-19 impacts. We did receive five applications. Those are under review right now, and we anticipate making recommendations to the board in the coming weeks. And then you can also see um, this week, we'll be releasing a request for proposals. I'm actually really excited about this one. Um, through our small business grants, we recognized um, we could provide a lot of help to small businesses on items such as IT, accounting, marketing, we noticed that, that that was a need through our grant funding. So we are issuing an RFP this week to have an entity administer this program on our behalf, and we can't wait to get the results in the coming month. Um, we also have an MOU under review right now with the Mental Health Recovery Services Board to expand the mobile crisis uh, team to 24-7. And lastly, on um, in, with, you know, right now we have the 513 relief bus. The new one is currently under production. And then you can see, starting in early fall, we have several grants that we'll be releasing, including uh, grants for youth resiliency, grants for suicide, uh, teen suicide prevention and workforce development training. And then we are currently um, reviewing the scope of work and drafting the agreement for our big pot of affordable housing dollars. So we'll be working with a, a third party to administer those funds on our behalf. We are so excited to get this program started, um, as, as is the uh, development community. 
Um, and then lastly, just two quick programs I want to mention. We have a draft request for proposals that's under review right now for the home repair program. And the agreement is under review with the CVB uh, in the amount of $2 million that we hope will be forthcoming to the board in the next month or so. So that's where we stand with the American Rescue Plan. It's a short, punchy presentation, but just wanted to, to share the highlights of the report that was submitted to Treasury and also show you what's coming up in the, in the next few weeks. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Holly, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, two million agreement under review. Can you say just a little bit about that? Sure. Um, because the, the tourism industry was hit so hard, uh, one of the hardest hit because of COVID, um, the Treasury does allow American Rescue Plan dollars to be used for that industry. So we allocated $2 million in, the, um, in our plan to, for the CVB, given their tremendous revenue reduction they had because of the hotel lodging tax, and also to use those, that funds to bring back more tourism uh, to Hamilton County. Okay. Um, and the other thing, Holly, if you could let the public know how long we have to spend this money. We're, we're on our way. Yes. $39 million, so could yes, you just let th the public know? Thank you. Know? Um, we have to obligate all the funds by December 31st of 2024 and spend them by the end of 2026. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Vice President Reese. Thank you, uh, Holly, for the update. Um, one thing I would uh, recommend, because people watching and they, you know, they're not in it, uh, like maybe you're in it every day, you live in it, you know, and uh, they're hearing rescue, uh, you know, cares, they don't know what it is, whatever it is, they need help. And so I think what will help us um, when they see these numbers, they seem low, but it's not. So maybe if we have like, here's what we allocated, here's what the board voted on, but this is what we've used so far. Yep. So that people don't confuse what we've used with what we voted on. Like you said, we have until 2026 mm -hmm. to spend it uh, because when people see small business, I thought y'all said y'all did 13 million. You ain't do but 2.9. So maybe I know you have, uh, to, for the public purposes, here's what we allocated, here's what we've spent, here's what you spent in the past. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, that we'll way, do. when they see the slide, they can get a better uh, understanding. Um, and then, because uh, we have done a lot uh, as a board and administration uh, to really get these dollars out. We've done, I think, a better job than probably any county in Ohio and in the country because uh, I get calls around the country with folks, I wish y'all were, I wish you were my county. <laughs> so uh, we want to make sure that we're promoting those things, those things that we've been able to get out and help a whole bunch of people. Uh, just like the arts program, we've, we spent 1.95 million this time, 53 grants, but we've gotten a whole lot of other money out to help the arts as well. I do have a couple questions. Um, the mortgage assistance, I don't know if it's been corrected. Hopefully it has. Uh, but, you know, it took too long for us, I think, to correct the mortgage part on our, um, on our website. It still said rental assistance. Mm. And we turned away a lot of people because we didn't have a mortgage program at first. And uh, that's one of the things I really uh, was really saying we need to get one. As I saw with the 513 relief bus, we turned away a bunch of people because they did, we didn't have a mortgage. So then we got the mortgage. It was toward the, I guess, the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't able to get as advertised as much, and then the bus wasn't out anymore. And so I think that's reflective of some of the numbers. We do have availability for mortgage, uh, folks who own a house that need help with, with their utilities, as well as if you own a house, your property taxes. And so at first, if you owned a house, you couldn't get anything right. because we only had a rental program. So I don't know if we really put the necessary push on the mortgage because it was at the end of the year. Um, the bus went, you know, we didn't have the bus anymore. So there was nothing to really push it out there. And I just wanted to make sure that I know that you said we're going to use uh, the voice of your customer, which is great. But I just want to make sure our back end, because people have called our office, and we say, go to the website, say, oh, no, that's rental. I own a house. And we still didn't have it fixed, which I thought was supposed to be fixed uh, earlier last year, mid-year last year. 
when we rolled it out, they said in two weeks we'll fit it, we'll you know we'll fix it, and it hadn't been fixed. So that's one. Um, and then second is, I would also recommend that we work with uh, the treasurer's office and see if there could be a mailing. I mean, the treasurer they mail you to tell you you behind. Uh, they should be able to mail you to tell you we got this program um, in there. And I'm sure that our treasurer would be willing to do that if there's a possibility. I don't know if there's an email system she may have, but I just recommend working with her because she's been very uh, accommodative and, and innovative and willing to get the information out with us. And her office has even went out with the relief -a -thon and those kind of things to try to get to people. So uh, not only with the voice of your customer, I think, combining it with the uh, treasurer's office and seeing if they have a list of folks that need this help that we could, you know, partner with and help get the message out uh, because that's a, a huge component. And it's very important to our affordable housing plan because we don't need people throwing out the house and then try to get a house. We're trying to keep people in the house and then those who need a house can also expand it. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up on this list, and it's nothing t to you at all, but I am very disappointed about this 513 relief bus. This was a positive, helping over 4,000 people, went everywhere, all the way, Cleves, Harrison, Ohio, couldn't wait to see the bus turn in there. Avondale, Bond Hill, we was helping everybody and doing such a great job. Everybody's, oh, man, the county is on wheels. And to take this long, and I know we can say, well, you know, there's parts and everything. We're building a Cincinnati Black Music Walk of Fame that's getting from the ground up. It's getting built before we can get this bus out here. And I'm just not happy with the manufacturer, whoever it is, they should be fired because something that's hot and helpful that, you know, most of the time we look at stuff and say, does the people really want it? I mean, people were sleeping in their cars waiting on this bus. And these are our, 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 our residents. And so they want this bus. And I don't understand how, I mean, sort of done come out with new buses. I don't see how come we can't get one bus done. And I'm very disappointed. I'm very, I just ain't never seen nothing this hot, this great. And we, and this much of a need, I mean, we're, I mean, we're moving quicker to, I mean, the Bengals got a new name and we still trying to get this bus. We got to do something. Um, and I'm just saying this to the administrator, um, but I wanted to let, I've said it to the administrator, but I just wanted to let, let everybody know my board know, I am totally and I've tried to think of everything. We had a body double. We done went and got UC Health's body double, and that thing tried to hold up as long as it can. But we going into two years, now maybe three years, trying to get a bus, and everybody, the ice cream man done got a new bus. We can't find a bus, and I just want that to be a priority. Um, so, under production, I need to move it out of under production and to get these wheels moving. I mean, 4,000 people we helped. 4,000. Can you imagine if we were up this year, 8,000 people might have been helped? So I know, Holly, you've been working hard and with the numbers, but I wanted to tell the administrator, I've told him privately, but I want my colleagues to know, we got to get this bus. This was, this was tremendous. This was groundbreaking for us. And um, I'm seeing health companies now popping up with buses everywhere. And if Sorta can get some new buses, what is taking us so long to get some one little bus? So that's where I am with that. And this number is low because I think we put more toward this effort so it can go four years. And I know that's, what, that's the thing I'm mentioning when you put this up is this is how much we uh, allocated for four right. years. And this is how much we'll be, you know, using. But I'm hoping we can use this and get this. But I don't, I even offered to find the manufacturer. I'll drive to Michigan and bring that bus back in here. But I don't understand what's taking us so long to just get one little bus. So the other thing I wanted to um, highlight is small business advisory services. This is new to me. Maybe I'm, or maybe it's mentioned a different way. 
I thought we had put money for a new small business office, and we wanted everything under one umbrella, the Office of Small Business. Would this fall under there, or is this something separate? This is, this is separate. So we have the um, Hamilton County Small Business Office through the general fund, the $100,000 that was authorized in the 2022 general fund budget. Mm -hmm. This is in addition to that. Mm -hmm. this, this was called in our plan the Small Business Back Office Support, if mm -hmm. you may recall that from our ARPA plan. Mm -hmm. um, we just changed the terminology of it. But this will be the same target mm -hmm. um, and can be connected with our Office of Small Business. It would be a, a helpful offering yeah. for our small businesses through this effort. Okay. Well, I just want to put this on the table. I'm moving away from uh, silos. Right. And I know financially there's silos, but there should be one office of small business. I'm not happy with what we got. This, what we're running with right now ain't, ain't what I was thinking of when I said office of small business. It should be an office of small business. I don't care if it's ARPA, CARES. Uh, whatever funding, the Office of Small Business, and they should be reporting to us, one entity, mm -hmm. on what they're doing. And if this is a uh, back-end service, it should back in to them. It shouldn't be, well, we're over here, and we're over there, and we're over here. It's no, I mean, it wasn't what I envisioned. So I'd like to, and I know I was the one that submitted the Office of Small Business that we should have, and I want to thank my colleagues to support it. But I'm not happy with it. It's not what I was thinking. It's this thing. This is no plaything with small business. We got stuff everywhere. If you got money for small business, it should all go up under this one umbrella. There should be one entity and one entity held accountable. Now, we might fund it through four or five different, just like the environmental person right. came. He's funded all over the place, but he's got one office, Office of Environmental. Now, it might come from the state, might come from fees, might come from there, but it's one guy mm -hmm. and his team. That's what I want for small business, not a whole lot of different, and maybe that's what you had in mind. Yeah, I think if eventually we will have a website that will be the Office of Small Business, which all of this will be incorporated into that. Right. So it will be a better marketing. Yeah, but beyond the website, I need a man or a woman like this person. Right. And their job is small business. My goal is for us to be number one in small business. We ain't going to be number one like this. We over here with grants. We over here with navigators. We over here. We can't do it like I need it like this environmental guy coming in here or the other guy that came in from soil or whatever. We need it structure, and you're very good at structure. But I'm saying that because I didn't get a chance to talk to you about it. But administrator, I'm not happy. With this, this is not what I wrote in my, when we had to turn in our budget, this ain't what I wrote. And this is not what I'm funded. This person that I met, they just walking around and doing the same old stuff that everybody else is doing. Claim they coaching and they're mentoring and, and business is going out of, out, of, out of business left and right. I'm looking, for, I'm looking for all funds that has the word small business to be under one umbrella like this environmental person to come up here and say, I'm the small business czar. And this is what we're doing for small businesses. And this is our phone number. We got a hotline. We go one place and that person can do something. Not, it's not a referral service. Oh, go over here and go over there. So we're not gonna become number one if we don't have a number one plan. So I would hope that after this year, because we're in the new budget now, mm -hmm. I want to sit down and have a real office of small business. I'm going to come back with it. And I don't want to just get it passed and we got what we got now. What we got now, is I know half the year don't win. We ain't done nothing. So I don't know what this small business service is. I'd like to learn more with you. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be another entity with another budget from Hamilton County. And, and if it didn't go to this small business office, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so that's where I was a little shocked or confused. So I'd like to hear more about that. And then lastly on, uh, well, two, on the home repair, I'm happy about that. I hope it comes with a hotline. That a hot, I think all of these things need to have a hotline number. So we as uh, commissioners, somebody call our office or we're out. We got a card or something. You, oh, man, I need some home repair. Here's the number. Uh, it has worked very good with the senior program. Um, I know many of us have gotten feedback from folks that said, man, that hotline really worked. 
we need a hotline to come with the home repair that we could get right to whoever that person is once, you know, once they uh, win the contract. Um, Convention and Visitors Bureau, let me just say, what we did last time with the CARES, and I wasn't, I wasn't really here, and they came back, because this is my area, they came back with this video and people with masks on and go over, that, no, we can't spend $2 million on that. It had no ROI. It didn't, and I asked them for ROI. They said, oh, we're not allowed to do ROI. Everything we do should have an ROI. If it's not bringing money in here, that's their job. We're not going around having some pretty pictures and videos. I want to see a real plan. And the last plan, I came in on the tail end of it, and they had, you know, you said that they were not allowed to do an ROI. They said it, not you. And I was curious about it. I said, wait a minute, I come from the state tourism. We weren't allowed to do anything without an ROI. So we got to have, what is the ROI? Don't just come down and say, oh, we, we had a tough year. Uh, I need to see what's the plan. And this $2 million, I need to see, it's got to be more than what we just did. So I hope that uh, it's not a final deal because I have some input. On it, I had asked about when it was. We were looking at, I guess, uh, legally if they were going to be able to do it. But I do want to have a little more input because I think we can get a little more ROI on the whatever the rollout is, as we are now open for business. I know they had a tough time before because nothing was open, but now we're open for business, and I just think uh, we can, you know, we could get a little bit more for two million dollars. And I have some ideas. Right, and to your point, Commissioner, um, this is different than what they did under CARES, um, given the, the, the different environment we're in and the different funding source. So we do have a scope of work. We do have metrics in the draft contract in terms of new groups to the area, increases in different you know, hotels, things like that that I'm happy to share with you. Yes, I would definitely like to, uh, I'd like to see that. Um, and then I, lastly, on the tourism piece, I want to just say that, um, as, and it's something I want to work with the, the uh, tourism, part, tourism department, we may want to do a study. I'd like a study to see on the hotel rooms. Years ago, there was gouging going on during the music festival, and there was protests and marches, and the hotel people had to stop it. I don't want us to return there, and I'd like to see a study on this year how much were the rooms on every weekend. And in the, um, in the, when we were trying to get the World Cup, we agreed in the contract that we would not have higher rates. We all, we had to sign that contract and Hamilton County signed it. I wanna know why at the music festival that I'm getting complaints from folks, why was it the highest rates in the whole year for any weekend. So I'd like to have them as uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau report to us because we don't want to go back to gouging or have that type of reputation. Um, so I just put that in there as, we're, as you're talking with them is to see some kind of study. I don't know, Mr. Administrator, you can get with the budget director. But my understanding is that the Rates jumped. I mean, we had red roof ends t costing almost $375, $400. And that is not the image that we're trying to put. We're welcoming, not gouging people. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that as you're going into contracts with them, Mr. Administrator, if you can get us a report on that. And then if it is, how are we going to stop it next year? Because we can't have that type of reputation. So as you're going into those negotiations, Mr. Administrator, I just ask that you would include that. Thank you so much, Holly, for all your work and all these numbers that you stay on top of, and it's hard, ARPA cares, ARPA cares, but the good thing is the federal government has given us money to help the people, and that's exactly what Hamilton County, we've been doing, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam, Jeff, did you want to address any? Of yeah, just, just very quickly, um, Madam President, so uh, on the, uh, on the, the pricing issues, we've done some initial work on that. I know that uh, um, the budget office had sent something out to the board, but this was prior to this current uh, music festival. So I've asked the budget office already to take a look at um, 
uh, revenues out of the STAR report in terms of what our occupancy uh, rate was and what the revenue was, um, the, the average rate uh, for, for that particular weekend this year. So once we have that uh, packaged up, we can send it to the board um, and we can use that for, for future conversations uh, as well. Um, on, on the matter, just so, because I have had multiple conversations with Commissioner Reese about this, but for the other board members, I'm not sure we've had uh, specific conversations uh, on the uh, matter of the 513 relief bus. Um, I think the timing we've been working for or working on for a couple of months, and I'm not saying I'm happy with it. I don't think anyone is happy with it. Um, I think the company has indicated that they would have the chassis available by August for production and delivery, hopefully by in the November timeline. So that's what we're looking for, looking at right now. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Administrator. Madam Chair, can we just ask, we are in, we getting ready to leave uh, August. So I don't know if the chassis is there or we would like to know it. We'll follow we, up and yes, see if it's, uh, yeah. if, if they're beginning production. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Drew House. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Holly. I, but I, I just want to be careful about this conversation about the 513 relief bus. I mean, all of us thought, it, and we all voted for it, thought it was a good idea. Um, and it is not out right now, but I don't want to give people the impression that the relief isn't there because the relief is available through um, two, 211, mm -hmm. uh, that line, the people can call for assistance and um, signing up with JFS. So I, I, wanted, I, I agree that it's been a frustratingly long timeline for the bus to get to us, but, I, but the relief is still available and people can access that relief by calling 211 or jumping on JFS's website or the relief a thon that took place as well. So I just want to, for the viewing public, to be careful about that. Yeah, um, Madam, I just, just so we can be real careful, um, we always had 211. Before I got here, 211. Uh, let's let her. No, I just want to make sure the bus part, because I don't want to, she's trying to say that I was kind of being misleading. We always had these That's other help. I'm just saying, I um, want to be clear. Order. Uh, if you could just let her complete, and then you can address whatever else. Oh, she I thought she's about. going to another topic. She is, but it's talking okay. about you can. I know you'll remember what she just said. Well, so I don't, we don't want to go back and forth. So yeah, no, and, and I don't. I'm again. I, I think that uh, we all voted for the the bus, and I think we all think it's a good idea. I just, I just don't want people to get the impression um, that the relief isn't available. That's all I was saying. All right. So about ARPA, thank you for the presentation. I I want to say that a high level. Um, this has been a, a wonderful opportunity for this administration and for this board to respond to some of what we know are the needs in the community. And I think you have done a very nice job with Sarah's help. I'm glad you're here, Sarah, because I was here when we were rolling through the CARES. And that was really challenging, and it wasn't as much money, um, but really challenging to roll that money out quickly. So I'm delighted that you're on board and, and helping with this effort. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of things that I think um, you've done a really great job on responding to what we've learned as we've rolled through some of these different rounds, particularly the small business. Um, we've learned a lot since the first round of this through CARES as we've moved through ARPA. And so um, I, I am looking at your chart, your pie chart, and I recognize that our target was the very small businesses and we hit that target. Um, so, and it was to the credit of you guys listening to the small businesses that were applying, some of whom did not get the money. And you saying, well, what, what's happening here that we did not hit some of our target on some of these funds. And so clearly we've hit the target on this one with the minority owned, women owned, and then minority and women owned together. Um, so I, I just want to recognize that and highlight it. And then I also was going to talk about the um, small business advisory services, because that again is something that we learned that some of these really small businesses don't have the capacity to even apply uh, or to apply successfully, I guess. And so we've responded to that now also with some of these ARPA dollars to try to help. And some of these are one, two, three people operations. And so um, really glad to see that money in there so that they are poised not only to receive some of the funding from the county and other, other places, but moving into the future, they recognize that there are some opportunities perhaps for grants and other things that they would be um, eligible to apply for. So just want to highlight those two things. The other one is the um, mobile crisis team. We've talked a lot during the levy 
conversation with mental health about mental health services in this community and the need for expanded mental health services. That, and and, and I, I think we were um, asked in a public hearing, I may have been asked privately, I don't remember, um, the question about weren't we um, allocating some of our ARPA dollars to mental health? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the primary things that we did through ARPA related to mental health, given the need in the community, but the need doesn't stop here. The need it continues and we need a sustained a funding source for mental health services in the community and so we all agreed that uh, we would put the increased amount on the ballot this year for people to vote on but I do want to highlight that this five million here uh, and I just read in the paper twice I believe the mobile crisis team was out um, on site in the community responding to emergency situations so the the need is there the time is now um, and so I just wanted to make sure that um, that was highlighted given some of the conversations we had related to the mental health services levy. And the one last one is the suicide prevention. That too we heard about um, with uh, the levy conversations. And I think you know, there was a lot of conversation amongst the board members about needing to do some of this work. And we did apply some of the ARPA dollars for that too. So just wanna highlight that for anybody that's watching and brought this to our attention. This is that the response uh, to what we heard. So thank you again for the work. Sarah, welcome <laughs> on board. Uh, really appreciate your work on this too. Yep. Madam President, yes. if I could just a quick clarification, not clarification, but uh, uh, just some additional detail on, on one of those points. Uh, uh, for folks watching at home, the expansion of the mobile crisis team, as the board uh, is aware, and I think was uh, in, uh, indicated in Commissioner Driehaus's comment, but I just want to make sure that's, that is uh, provided to the mobile crisis team, but the, the levy funding is seamless with this. So we're implementing uh, the, uh, some, that, some of that expansion through ARPA, but then, as you indicated, the, the levy picks up where this leaves off uh, when we're not, no longer uh, able to spend those dollars, the levy can pick up in the long term for the, for the expansion of the mobile crisis team. So they, the two work together well, uh, both in terms of continuing the program and also appropriately sizing of the levy as well. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Vice President Rishi wanted to comment on uh, something she has said as relates to the bus. Yeah, I just want to say also point of order, rebuttal is not a bad thing. Um, so I, I think, I don't know, I'm the only person that's ever said point of order. I'm like, okay, well, what's the charge? Well, uh, uh, but rebuttal I, is fine. Rebuttal is okay. It's, yeah, it's but, fine. And that was a topic that was, a, I'm the only one that gets attacked on when I say something, so I shall have the right to rebuttal. Now, if someone questions my, uh, my integrity of what I said, I got to clarify. That's not a point of order. That is a rebuttal. Well, let me so explain. Let me, let me finish since you said we each well, got to finish. Let me explain the point of order. Well, is I mean, it's not the first time. Let, it's, me, it ha let, me, let me just finish, please. Here we go again. Yeah. No. So let no. me explain the point of order is that Commissioner Driehaus was presenting her comments as it relates to ARPA. And uh, the bus was just one comment. So I needed to allow her to finish all her comments as it relates to ARPA, and then go back to you to see what comments she had that you had a question about. So it's just well, point of I, order to allow everybody to say their comments, move to the next person, right. and then if you have an issue with it, you or any of us, then we can, and I don't even see it as a rebuttal. Well, maybe that, but, well, I think it is a rebuttal because you indicated that because of the bus, people can't still get help. That was not my comment. And I wanted to correct it on the spot, well, not let it go forward. It. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, so that's that's where we are. And I'm always going to speak out. I'm never going to be muzzled. Yeah, so let me be clear with that. Order. There is no point of order. That's a part of opinion. Okay, it was your opinion. So all I want to do is clarify the fact that I did not say that people can't get help. Two one one always was there. Two one one has always been there. So has JFS. They've been always there. What I was saying was that the bus was able to help additional people, and I do have an issue that the bus is not ready to go. I think it's been a long enough time for this bus to be built, and I think a lot of people would agree with me. I'm only speaking for the people. I don't, I don't need the 513 relief bus myself. I'm speaking for what the people are saying. And so I don't want to come in here and speak for the people and keep getting gaveled down whenever I'm speaking for the people. And if you don't believe me, let's take this out to the people and see what they have to say. I went to 74 locations, 74 out of 79. 
So I do have, I do come in here with a, a, a sense of urgency. 74 out of 79 locations, and if anybody went to those many locations, then you can stand with me. You might have the same, you might get just as mad as I've gotten about this bus not being ready to go. And that's what I had brought up to the administrator, and it's not to say people can't get help. They, that's to say they was getting help before, but these people weren't. They've, that's what they've said. They weren't getting help before this bus. So, yeah, I come in here, and it might not be, uh, you know, it's not going to always be, yeah, 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 I'm coming in here because that's what they sent me in here to do. And I'm speaking up because they keep asking me about the bus. Not to Holly, she don't have anything to do with the bus. She's just presenting the money is ready to go, we just don't have a bus. Then the administrator came on and said the bus was supposed to be here in August. We are almost out of August. We're going into September. So, of course, I said, well, wait a minute, where is the chassis? If we knew that, that would have been reported today with this report. So, yes, I'm not, I'm not going to come in here and be happy all the time if the people ain't happy. And the people ain't happy. And 211, we've had a million people call our office that 211, they couldn't get through. 211 is everything. So that's why we came up with the bus. So that's all I was saying. And honestly, don't know why it was a, a, a rebuttal of the bus to me. But I'm going to stand up. So that's why I wanted to clarify what I was saying at that particular moment. So uh, again, I, I stand by my position. Uh, this bus should be up. We're almost out of August. I ain't seen nothing yet come before me saying that the bus has arrived. So that's why I have some concerns. And the bus has a massive value. This ain't something I just did. The NAACP want to know, where is the bus? People stopping me, where is the bus? People calling our office, where is the bus? Now, if you'd like me to invite all of them to show up, we can have a town hall, and then we can see, is the bus have any value? So that's kind of where I am, and that's what I, we, it was on the agenda on the list. I brought it up. I asked the question. I said, I'm not happy that it's not here, and that's where it stands. And I just want to make it clear, there's no rebuttal on the bus, because the whole board has said that the bus has made uh, a dramatic impact in the community. And we're all concerned about the bus coming. We all work with our people, and we've been elected to do that. The bus is important to all of us. And um, I want to reiterate the fact that people are still being helped, were being helped before I even got here, continue to be helped. Uh, through JFS and other uh, sources to make sure they're not left behind. So uh, we're very concerned, and I don't have to go to every community to know that. We know that when we're out in the community. So um, just want to make it real clear that we're uh, full speed ahead. We want that bus here, uh, that we're 100% uh, in support of, of the bus there, so there's no uh, distinction on I either any of the commissioners or who wants it and who doesn't, we all want it because we know it did a great job and it reached a lot of people. We continue to reach a lot of people and can reach more when the bus arrives. I just want to make sure that I, I was clear in what I had indicated. And I think Commissioner Reese may have echoed this, but I just want to make sure that the delivery of the chassis is to the manufacturer who then puts the bus into production to deliver to us in November. So I just wanted to make it clear if I was, if I had sent the message or if I had indicated that we were expecting delivery of something here to Hamilton County in August, that is not the case. It was delivered to the, manuf it would be delivered to the manufacturer who then puts it into production. And we'll follow up to see where that is. It was, I think it's supposed to be by the end of August, they were gonna get the chassis. So we'll follow up and, and make sure that's occurring. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Um, our next item on the agenda is MSD 2022 operating budget quarterly to a report. I don't see any. Oh, he's here. Okay. Okay. 
Good afternoon, Madam President and Commissioners. I know it's been a long meeting, so thank you for having me today. Um, I guess the good news is I'm here just to present on our quarter two um, operating budget report. And I talked with you, I don't know, I guess it's been a couple months now um, after the first quarter and generally um, we're, you know, look, we're in the same shape we were before. Um, looking at the appropriated budget for 2022 for MSD's operation, um, we are projecting that we will stay, in, stay within the approved appropriated funds that this board passed last December. Um, so I put together the, the slides just um, are going to highlight the tables that are in the memo that you already have. Um, as you know, our operating budget, we um, generally go through uh, the sections through the personnel, the non-personnel, uh, the SBU program, our capital outlay, uh, and our debt payment. Um, and that's the, the format of the report in front of you. So just starting overall, um, this is our, 20, our quarter two report. So that's the end of uh, June. And uh, as we show there, we're showing both um, the totals that have been expensed, meaning those um, items that have been paid, um, as well as what we have committed to date. So as you look at the committed, um, again, we are uh, showing that we, um, you know, we've in some areas spent more than half the budget halfway through the year. Um, that's pretty typical. Um, and our projections all indicate that we will stay, in with the, stay within the approved budget um, throughout this year. This is just a visual we provided, um, again, showing where we have committed funds and uh, the number of uncommitted funds in each of um, those uh, items, as previously mentioned. So again, um, from our standpoint, this all is tracking as it should. Breaking down the personnel, um, so this is on page two of your report. Um, similar to what we shared with you following the first quarter, um, so our personnel budget, as you know, is approved based on our divisions. We have seven divisions, and we also separate out the SBU uh, personnel dollars. But our seven divisions, um, those are, as indicated there, just to briefly run through them, we have the Office of Director, which is one of our smaller divisions, Wastewater Engineering, Wastewater Administration, uh, Information Technology, Wastewater Treatment, Wastewater Collection, um, RCS is Compliance Services, and then the SBU. So um, both personnel and non-personnel are all appropriated um, under, those, uh, under each of those divisions. And as we um, are showing, again, overall, the percent committed um, is within the approved budget. And as we highlighted last time, um, in a couple of our smaller divisions, we do show that we would need a personnel adjustment uh, based on the, the budgeting that we did um, going into this year. So um, as noted uh, in the report, generally speaking, um, we are below the target. And so we are below 50%. And this is um, due to just in general, our position vacancies um, being higher than overall as a department, um, overall what we budgeted for. And then our um, engineering capital labor reimbursement allowance. Um, that's kind of how we have a little bit more uh, personnel budget than um, we are projecting we will need through the, in, through the end of the year. Um, the issues that we identified previously are those um, that are indicated uh, at the bottom of the page requiring, potential, requiring interdepartmental transfers. Um, and these are just, you know, our budget process, especially on the personnel side, um, as with any budget, uh, these are projections. Uh, it's not an exact science. And, and when we bring the budget to you, uh, we provide a draft budget in, aug in August, so we just provide one for next year. And at that time, there are certain things that we don't know um, that we're estimating. So the cost of living increases, the health care increases, I mean, of course our vacancies uh, and our personnel um, potential retirements and hirings are all you know, things that we're projecting when they, how they will play out throughout the year. Um, so those variables are all unknown. They come closer into picture um, as the year goes on, and that's what we're faced with now. Um, our IT division in particular is one where, um, because of its, you know, its smaller size um, and some of those variables, um, we really don't have um, 
the, the ability to absorb perhaps um, those variables changing. And so this year um, we are uh, going to be requesting, not today, but um, we are going to be preparing a request for an adjustment uh, between the personnel as, as recommended in this memo. Um, the other one that we highlighted was um, the other division is just a need in the Office of Director, and this is just an organizational change where we move certain positions from one division to the other. Um, probably the largest one there is Joseph Schuster, who is here with me today, our budget manager. That position previously was funded out of a different division, and he is now working directly for me. So I can move on then to our non-personnel summary. Um, again, that budget ordinance is not here before you today, um, and, and that'll be provided uh, before the end of next month is our plan. For non-personnel, um, as we projected at the beginning of the year or back in December, um, we knew that we were going to have a lot of increases um, in many of our essential expenditures, things like chemicals, um, power, uh, natural gas, um, our supplies and contracted services. We've seen a large increase, but we budgeted for that, um, and we've continued to uh, manage that budget within the uh, approved um, dollars for each division. So you can see there the percent committed, um, you know, and overall uh, a little higher than 65%, um, um, but that is, you know, that is pretty typical. Um, some of those costs are incurred earlier in the year, some are incurred later in the year, so it's not steady each quarter. Um, overall, really nothing there uh, of concern, um, but we do just always want to note that we're, we're tracking closely, um, and at this time we don't perceive any issues or any need for additional appropriation. Um, so the SBU, we spent a fair amount of time um, in a prior meeting talking about the SBU program generally. We just include this here as a separate item in our budget. Um, and these are just uh, a few of the um, highlighted uh, figures uh, on the screen. Um, so this is how much we've, you know, we spent a little over seven million uh, at the end of the second quarter. And um, we, you know, we've performed um, over 2,000 SBU investigations. We've reimbursed claims uh, close to half a million. Um, and I do like to also just remind everyone there's a report that we produce monthly, so more than quarterly we're reporting on all of these, and I know you can't read that, I apologize, but um, this is on our website at msdgc.org um, forward slash SBU. So you can go to that, um, go down to the resources um, in the right column, and this report is updated monthly, and it has all of the um, expenditures and actual investigations and claims uh, that we conduct each month. So moving on, we have our, um, so our capital outlay, outlay, these are just the, um, the operating expenditures that um, we have categorized with our fleet and then our office technology equipment. Um, we actually had a reduced budget this year from 2021, so um, managing um, that as best as we can. We don't uh, we will not go over budget on either one of these items. Uh, so as you can see there, um, it shows what we've committed to date. Uh, debt service, really not much um, there uh, to mention. It's pretty much on track with and in line with our expectations. Uh, revenue summary, again, probably better to look at your paper there uh, than on the screen. It's a little bit small. Um, but the revenue uh, really is um, as forecasted. We actually are um, slightly up over, um, you know, over 50% at the end of June um, for our general sewer service charges. Um, a couple of the other categories up, up a fair amount. Um, that's where we bring in um, through our fees, permits and fees, where we bring in revenue there. Um, you know, not nowhere near the um, significance of our revenue, um, our sewer service charges, but as you can see, we, we do see an uptick this year, um, likely due to um, really a lot of activity in the, in the permitting and, and construction world, so uh, after COVID. Um, but all in all, you know, revenue is as forecasted and as um, projected. Um, that really brings me to the end. I just put the summary of all of the uh, of the entire budget up there um, and open for questions on any particular item. Thank you.
Yes, thank you for the presentation. Can we go back to the um, SBU component? Uh, yes. Quarter two personnel budget summary. On the, I'm uh, sorry, you want to on the um, yeah um, line 480 SBU on the personnel. Yes. Uh, can you break that down a little bit? I know that what we have budgeted, where we are now, uh, are we going to be on target or? So our SBU personnel um, is a, you know, we have a certain group that's within, uh, they're managed within our wastewater collection division, but those dollars are charged to the SBU program for that work. Um, I mean, we do show that we are under on our personnel there. Um, I, I think that we actually may be a slightly understaffed. Is that the case, Joseph? If There you go. So we, we have some, that's due to vacancies and a limited amount of overtime usage. So with the SBU program in particular, we budget. Um, often we do have a lot of overtime for those staff. And this year we fortunately have not had any of the, uh, as many of those um, type of events where we have a lot of overtime uh, being charged to that account. So that's likely why it's a little bit under. Gotcha. I just was wondering, does this the l lack of staffing, does that affect the, you know, getting uh, the work done, the amount of work that can get done? No, um, I haven't seen, we haven't had any issues really with, uh, so there's not all of the personnel that would work in, in the event of an emergency is being charged to that because we have the same crews that run emergencies for all of our sewer um, sewer services um, are the crews that get staffed for sewer backup responses. So um, it's kind of, it's one of those things where uh, the, all of the personnel dollars don't really represent probably all of the um, effort that goes into responding to any given event. So I, I have not, um, while we, you know, there perhaps are administrative things sometimes that we lack um, or we lag a little bit when we have vacancies, um, reporting, communication, in terms of the the services that we provide, we really um, are not uh, experiencing any um, disruption in terms of staffing. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you, thank you, Diana, for the presentation. Um, I'm having a hard time deciphering the, the page that was hard to read, the SBU page. I've got it in front of me though, and but this is the first time I'm seeing it. So um, when you talk about the SBU program expended seven million or so um, and then you break that down and then you talk about the reimbursement claims cost of 475,000 um, can, can you just help me better understand the seven I guess the seven million I'm looking at the chart um, some of it is it, talk talk to us about what, what is clean up what is contracted what is um, the MSD time uh, to do the investigations how does this all break down so let me, um, I think, clarify because this um, chart that this is printed out from uh, what we have on our website today, uh, probably uh, it could cause some confusion because this isn't exactly tied to our annual budget appropriation. Um, so when we provide, um, you know, the total expended for the entire year, um, well, actually, uh, let me just see, because that one, it doesn't have the seven million on it. Um, so if we try to break out, for example, claims that are paid, um, we're, we're talking about claims that were paid in, you know, in this calendar year. Uh, but we may be on this table, it wouldn't uh, include, so it, probably not for claims, but the prevention program I think is where it, it's encumbered, okay. Well, that, that helps even, that's probably even simpler than what I was trying to explain, which is that sometimes things cross over from year to year in terms of where these expenditures fall. But um, what Joseph just reminded me is that um, the money is uh, what is the expen expenditures versus what's committed um, in terms of the seven million that we have indicated has been um, spent for the SBU program. I don't I'm sorry, that, maybe I don't know if that was supposed to be clarifying, but <laughs> I, I did not find that to be clarifying. I'm just simply looking and, and maybe... You're looking at this part. Yeah, maybe we can have a different conversation at another time, but 
I'm just simply trying to understand the breakdown of you know, the amount that's being spent, because this is a program that we talk about a lot and people are very concerned about. And so I'm just wondering if we get a breakdown of the amount of money that's been spent to clean up basements, the amount of money that's spent by MSD to go investigate, you know, uh, whether or not someone is qualified. Uh, you know, it, it just, it's just not clear um, as to how this money is being spent. And that's all I'm asking for is okay. just more clarity around the amount of money that is being spent. I'm not questioning the amount. I just would like to see a breakdown of that. Okay. Yes, um, we can provide that. And I would say that the, um, the spreadsheet that we have is um, probably only partially there in terms of how those dollars are broken out because this is focused a little bit more on, on sharing, um, you know, the results of investigations than it is the dollars spent. That would, so. yeah, yeah, this is not clarifying. So, yeah, if you could break okay. it down differently, that would Yes, I can provide that to you, you. Um, uh, after today. Okay. Yet this week. That's all I have to say. Diana, um, as you look yes. at that same sheet, um, it says settlement checks process two. And I'm thinking, um, like, if we went back to 2017, it was almost 1,200. Keeps going down and down and down. And so I'm just wondering, um, and you don't have to answer it now, but uh, two, two checks out of all the SBU um, complaints we have, a lot of them, as, we, as I have said, have not qualified, and we're looking at some sort of outside or additional program where pe more people can qualify. That number is just so low. Um, uh, yeah, um, I've, I'm looking at the July totals that I had looked at today, um, which you don't have, uh -huh. and we had 55. So I'm wondering if either we just, uh, it doesn't make sense that, that in June it said two. Okay. So to be honest, I, I'll have to look at why um, it says two, because I know we, I get a summary of those every month, and okay. that must be an error on that ju June. Okay. And, and so, lastly, if you could look at the, the next page, uh, the non-personnel, where it has debt service. It was like two sentences, I think. Oh, I wonder if you mm -hmm. could, because it's not on here at all. Um, I think I just uh, shortened it. So the debt service, um, this is just our, you know, our, our payment of our sure. debt, and uh, that's with 48% of um, what we had appropriated for the debt service payments. Okay. So I'll just add it in here. Okay. I think it was on there. It just may be hidden right under the SBU. Um, it, it might not be in the same uh, order on yeah, my... I can't see it, but okay. I just wanted to see that part. Okay. Yes. All right, that's all I had. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have... Now, what about this? Is that incorporating this? Um, yeah, so that's where, so in the memo is where you'll see uh, okay. that information. Um, I, for the slide presentation, I just pulled out the tables just to, for the guests in the room. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, our next order of business is um, item five. Um, I'd like to make a motion to go into executive session pursuant to RC section 121.22G3 to conduct a conference with an attorney concerning the subject of pending litigation. Second. Commissioner Samaro Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes.